Um, I'm conscious that the items that we have left on the agenda, um, at least at least two of them, are very significant items, and I'd like to complete our agenda today, which means a certain amount of discipline on all of us around the table. Um, but I'll just take the, the, the mood of the meeting. Uh, I'd like procedurally to move that we continue our, our business until uh, complete tonight. Happy to second. Yep. Being seconded. Uh, I'll, I'll put that motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Happiness and unanimity. It might be the only time we see it this afternoon. Um, councillors, if I can bring your attention to item number 14, uh, the issue I think that uh, the, the general public will be most interested in our deliberations on today. Um, we have at the table uh, Dean Kimpton, our Chief Operating Officer, uh, Megan Tyler, um, Rod Marler and Fiona Knox, Rod and Fiona representing Panuku today. Um, I'm going to suggest, I think, Rod, you'll want to lead off on the presentation. Um, but we're also fortunate uh, to have uh, Sir Stephen Tyndall and uh, Kevin Shoebridge here uh, from Team New Zealand. And with the approval of councillors, I think that's a great opportunity for us to ask questions to them directly. So if there is no objection after the presentation, uh, I'll invite Sir Stephen and Kevin to the table and give councillors the opportunity to ask questions because this is a unique opportunity to hear directly from Team New Zealand about what their needs are uh, as against what their wishes may be. Uh, so we might need to test, uh, test that out. Um, so welcome back everybody and Rod if I can ask you to uh, begin the presentation please. Thank you, Your Worship, and uh, councillors, um, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to present to you again. Um, following the workshop that was held last Monday, a number of you have taken advantage of the opportunity to have a tour of the area that we are talking about to get a better understanding of the issues at hand, uh, get an understanding of the scale of the options that we're talking to and some of the implications. So I want to thank you for that because that's certainly going to make our job today here a lot easier uh, if you're fully briefed and you understand the detail. So just starting the presentation, um, Fiona, you want to drive that for me? Um, I'll just take you back to where we were last Monday on the 13th when we held the workshop and we discussed one of the key criteria along with, and I'll just go through them again, the four key criteria that um, we're really looking for a decision on is around... Um, the operational effectiveness, so fit for purpose is, is critical, uh, around the land space available, around the water space and depth available. Uh, this, the option must be consentable, that's the second point. The third point, it must minimise uh, impact on business as usual. It has to meet the program and we have to work within a, a budget envelope that hopefully we can uh, agree on today. So. I think it's important that we understand the criteria that we're working with um, and we really look at, at this first slide as an opportunity to deliver on all of these criteria, environmental, social, cultural and, and economic. Next slide. Um, this has become a contentious slide and I sat in or we sat in on the, um, on the presentation this morning and um, I'd just like to say that the, uh, uh, the extension to Halsey Wharf was a hard line option in the Waterfront Plan 2012. It has been dotted since then in subsequent plans, but obviously uh, subject to um, this conversation and, uh, and the knowledge that America's Cup was coming. And you'll also notice that there's a, an extension to Captain Cook Wharf, which is the footprint that would have been required if the event was to be held on Captain Cook Wharf. So just to explain that right up front in case there are any, any questions um, about that slide. The other thing I'd just like to draw your attention to is this is how each of the wharves could be utilised in, in a future time. So cast your mind ahead 20, 25, 30 years and starting in the west with Wynyard Point we have mixed use developments, the marine industrial developments and the open space that is uh, covered under the current plan change, uh, reconfigured, because you'll note this is different from the current plan change, but the areas are identical, but we, what we're saying here is that Wynyard Point will be fully developed uh, within the next, 
or we hope, 10 to 15 years. Coming through Halsey Wharf, that's just the outline that was outlined in the Waterfront Plan 2012, where it was noted as uh, Auckland's permanent water-based events space. Uh, coming further east to Prince's Wharf, uh, no change there. Uh, further east again to Queen's Wharf, and as has been discussed earlier today, Queen's Wharf, the People's Wharf, the place that the people of Auckland and, and residents in Auckland City come to recreate, enjoy, and get out onto the, on, onto the water and close to the water. And then moving further east again, Captain Cook, which has been identified in the cruise strategy, long-term cruise strategy, as the long-term um, berthage for cruise ships where we could double, um, double effi we'll get efficiency from double berthing a cruise ship either side. I'd also like you to note that <coughs> the land-based or the land side development is as the diagram you have seen and have approved as part of um, the, um, the, the water or the city centre waterfront plan uh, with the work to Key Street and, uh, and the block behind Key Street. The next one. Just as a, a reminder around the, the, the incredibly tight time frame that we're working under, and a reminder that um, really work started on this uh, in July, and um, all of the work that you've seen, the reports that you've seen, and there's a, there is a big, uh, a very solid technical report that sits behind the, the report that came to councillors. Um, we started that work in, at the, uh, in the middle of July, and here we are in, uh, in towards the end of November seeking a decision. An enormous amount of work has, has been done, but what we are really seeking today uh, is um, your approval to proceed to continue to work up design work so that we can lodge consent um, in January if we are going to meet the, the time frame. So just a reminder of these critical milestones. You're considering the, the three options that um, you received the paper on papers on today. 14th of December, a decision on, on location and final costs, which um, we'll be able to firm up uh, in the intervening uh, days between now and the 14th. Uh, December, we are seeking a decision from central government, uh, also um, in alignment with, with council around location and funding. And then, as I mentioned, consent lodgement mid-January, uh, running through to July, with a procurement process that would overlap that so we could start construction July, August, um, next year, running through until September 19, when the first teams are expected to arrive. And then the event held the back end of 19 through 20, uh, when the boats will be trialling, training, there will be some regattas held, and then the Prada Cup and America's Cup early 2021. So I'd just like to remind you also, on the next slide, um, the key assumptions that we've been working with and these are, uh, again, very important and have in informed the options that we have brought to you. Time frame, as I said, the America's Cup event in uh, March 2021, Prada Cup prior to that, uh, the December, uh, sorry, the Christmas Cup in December 2020, just prior to that. And as noted, there are preliminary regattas uh, through 19 and 20. In terms of the number of teams, um, there are uh, eight teams expected, likely, possibly ten, um, but Team New Zealand um, uh, have suggested that eight is the most likely number. Three teams will want to be based in Auckland from summer of 19, so we need to be ready for them, and all teams would be in Auckland by the end of 2019. In terms of the, uh, the land space and the water space required, and this has come up in one of the questions um, that has come through that I'll, I'll, I'll come to shortly, um, there are both double and single bases. Now, double bases are for the teams that wish to, uh, wish to challenge with a two-boat challenge, and they'll be housing two boats simultaneously, and during testing, they would have both boats out in the water. Single bases <coughs> are for those teams who, uh, who for whatever reason um, would select a, a single boat challenge, uh, they don't require as much space. What is of critical importance, uh, and, and this has come through time again from Team New Zealand, is the quality of the water space that the boats are launched into. And that is to ensure, firstly, the health and safety of the crews that are launching the boats, and most particularly because the rigs will be put into the boats once the boats are in the water, the boat cannot be moving around too much. There is a significant risk of damage to these lightweight craft 
if the boats are moving around. So sheltered water space, <coughs> and you've seen the videos of the proposed craft. It's an amazing looking boat, and I think you'd all agree, um, very, very exciting. But one of the challenges is it has a, a significant draft. So it needs at least five and a half metres at mean low water. Uh, so we need that depth right alongside the wharf space where they will be launched. And in addition to those race craft, there are support craft. Um, <coughs> uh, so that'll be the small motorised craft and potentially between three and five super yachts that will come with the syndicates. So when we talk about super yachts, some will be coming <coughs> independently, but a lot of them are directly related to the challenges themselves and come as part of that, uh, part of that syndicate. The next item, the fourth item, um, is the village feel and the, um, the fundamental requirement. And if you cast your mind back to the success of the viaduct, and those who are in Valencia will also remember on a similar basis where that village atmosphere was created with all of the bases co-located. <coughs> so the boats were all together, the crews were all together, um, the infrastructure was shared, and more importantly, the public could see all of the challenges and the defender all in one place. Around all of that is all of that activity that is generated by the sponsors, that is generated by the other boats, including the super yacht activity, and it becomes the go-to place. And you'll, you'll remember that magical photograph in 2000 <coughs> that was taken from the top of Team New Zealand looking into the viaduct when Sir Peter Blake held that America's Cup aloft, surrounded by tens of thousands of, of, of Aucklanders and their families and friends and people from overseas to, to celebrate the victory. That's the sort of atmosphere that we're talking about. The next item, security. Obviously, security between the bases is uh, paramount, um, and the, the teams will look after their individual security. Uh, but not only between bases on the land, but also from the water, and being able to manage that in a more controllable, confined, and agglomerated space <coughs> is um, of, of significant benefit. And then lastly, but probably most importantly, um, this legacy issue and the importance of leaving a maritime legacy for the city and for the people of Auckland. And that's not just around event legacy, that's around education, it's around sustainability, it's around a pathway for our young people, and it's not just about sailing, it's about all water-based events, whether it be Waka Armour, whether, whether it be the small boats, whether it be the etchel racing, whether it be triathlon, swimming, um, whether it be food and wine festival, whether it be seafood, whatever uh, is related to the marine environment, there's an opportunity to create a legacy in that regard. So just coming back to this importance of the village effect, and this is what we covered under, uh, in the workshop under Lessons Learnt, one of the important lessons that did come through from previous regattas. Um, that village experience is a combination of the commercial activities around the corporate hosting and events and branding and sponsorship around the public access. And this event, the success of this event, and the reason that the public of Auckland and New Zealand are so excited about this is that they will get a chance to see these amazing craft and their crews, not only as they launch and depart, but as they arrive back at the bases and live on the big screens that will be down there and op possibly op op an opportunity to get out on the water and watch the racing. So viewing, entertainment, the merchandising, everybody wants to wear uh, a piece of the clothing of, of their favourite team and uh, a view of that arrivals and departures pontoon. Team operations, which is critical and getting the logistics right, fit for purposes, as I said earlier, about health and safety, security, logistics and the support craft, and then the logistical piece around servicing and those support craft, the media centre, uh, we can't forget the international media and that presence and the craft that the media will be commandeering as well. Just on to those decision-making criteria that I touched on earlier. And I'd just like you to remember these four items as we do discuss the three options because we need a clear uh, framework for decision-making around the options. So the first one, delivery. And this is this critical time constraint that we have. Can the bases be delivered in the time frame required? If we can't meet that, we can't hold the event. It's as simple as that. Second criteria, the event. 
the extent to which the bases provide the best outcome for servicing the needs of the event. So there are fit for purpose requirements around hosting the event. The legacy piece which we've talked about, so the extent to which the option that we select delivers a sustainable benefit beyond the event itself. And then that last one, the impact on business as usual, because some of these options do have a significant impact on existing businesses and we have to factor that into our costings and impact on timing for delivery. So just taking you back, because I, I think it's important that we put all of the options in context. We started with a long list, and uh, you'll recall at um, the planning committee meeting in August, we discussed this long list with you, and we discussed the criteria that we were going to use for evaluating each of the locations in its draft form. And I, um, I'm, I'm sure that I can reflect that there was a general agreement with the process that we were following at that stage. So just going through the nine long listed locations, and these were all rejected um, for quite obvious reasons, and I'll just run through them very quickly. So starting with Bayswater, we could only uh, really provide um, space for two bases. We had um, a problem for providing space for any event village, um, and there would be limited legacy. There was also a significant issue around depth and the, the amount of dredging required so we could provide the sufficient water depth. Gulf Harbour, and I know the developers up at Fairway Bay were very keen to, uh, to host a component of the event up there. However, on investigation, uh, the Fairway Bay, which is, um, if you're looking at that diagram in front of you, it's the middle one, Fairway Bay is to the top right. We could only provide one base and uh, access to that base would require dredging, and the dredging is through rock. So it's not just dredging, it's actually blasting. So the cost and timing on, the, on that was prohibitive. And then you're probably all aware of the issues around uh, the hammerhead. Uh, we could provide seven bases only across there. Again, event space was problematic, and we would have to um, relocate approximately 100 berths and break those leases. So again, timing and cost considerations and legacy, uh, not much legacy on that one. Hobsonville, this is pretty much a no-brainer. The land that could have been utilised is now <coughs> under the control of Willis Bond, and they're, um, they're already on site uh, with their apartment development um, down at the landing, and there is no deep water access. Devonport, closer to home, um, and this, this was uh, an option which was, has been considered in, uh, in previous defences. Plenty of deep water. Um, the big problem here being uh, we'd have to ask the Navy to uh, relocate, which I think everyone would agree was, would be uh, difficult to achieve given, given the time constraints we have. Um, event space, problematic, and the sea conditions, because of where it's located, very, very exposed, and we would be up for considerable cost to create the sort of sea conditions that the teams would need for launching and retrieval. Okahu Bay, we considered this. Uh, again, uh, the space that Council controls close to where the boats could be launched, uh, we could only provide for three bases. Um, again, limited space. Uh, having to remove existing berths and leases and relocating those boats, and that marina is in private ownership, so again, problematic. Uh, West Haven Marina, this, uh, this looked for a while like it, it could have been uh, a, a possible op opportunity for us. Um, However, we, when we looked at the cost of relocating uh, the existing berth holders, um, the breaking the leases, uh, the reclamation and structural deck that was required because you need to be able to get to it, um, the number of bases that it could provide for, um, the legacy value, and probably most importantly, um, it's a remoteness from, uh, from the other locations. So this would mean that a number of bases would be remotely located um, from other bases. Captain Cook, and uh, we discussed this at length um, at the workshop uh, last week. Um, op two options on Captain Cook, launching the boats to the western side of Captain Cook towards <coughs> Queen's Wharf. And then we had an op another option which didn't um, impact crews because this, this option would obviously have a significant impact on crews with no cruise ships being able to berth on either Queen's or Captain Cook. So we had another option, launching the boats to the east. Um, which was problematic for the ports and their ability to utilise Bledisloe Wharf. However, it was certainly favourably considered from access, um, construction methodology reasonably straightforward. We could get all the bases in one location, 
and we could run the two wharves, Cook and Queen's, together to create an event space. Um, but it was really that impact on business as usual for both crews and the port business, which was going to be problematic for us. And that was a very, very expensive exercise to create the sheltered water space required. Um, what we call Wynyard Wharf Site 18, uh, which we've um, been asked to reconsider following um, a, 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 a tour with the Minister and um, a number of groups over this last weekend. Um, this, was, uh, this was failed because of the existing lease situation, uh, impact on business as usual, and the, the dispersed nature of the bases. But we'll discuss this in more detail because, as I said, we've done some more work on it since, uh, since last weekend. And then the last one was the, was the initial Halsey Wharf extension, which was where we started back in August uh, with Team New Zealand, attempting to get all the bases in one location on a new wharf extension. Um, and um, this, this one, um, really the, where, where we got to with this one is we, we managed through the work with Team New Zealand to refine um, their base design and we're still continuing to do that. So the option that, that's now on the table is one of the three is a refinement of, of this option, of an improvement of this option. So then getting to the shortlisted, um, we've really narrowed it down, uh, having knocked out Captain Cook at the workshop um, the West Haven option at the workshop um, with three remaining options, the Halsey extension, um, what we're now calling the Wynyard Basin and um, the Wynyard Point option. So we can talk to each of those uh, in a little, little more detail. You'll recall um, at the workshop we had five options and um, as I said we did, uh, we did eliminate um, three of those to get to two and then with a third one added just this last weekend. So what we've done to make this easier uh, to draw direct comparisons, we've looked at the three locations directly comparing each of the three uh, locations against the criteria um, of um, in, in development phase, in event phase, in legacy phase, and then on impact on business as usual. So we're taking four snapshots and comparing each of the three options. And we, we felt, and this is, a, this is a result of feedback from councillors, um, that this would be the, the most clear way for councillors to draw direct comparisons. So as I said, in addition to the Wynyard Basin, which is the, which the, we previously called the clustered option, which is um, the mayor's favorite option, uh, the Halsey extension, um, and the Wynyard Point, the new Wynyard Point, uh, which was a previously a dispersed <coughs> option. We've looked at each of these in those in those four categories. So let's let's start off with delivery phase. And under each of these images, you'll see we've got some bullet points there. <coughs> we have attempted to be even-handed as possible uh, when evaluating each of these three options and each of those four um, four frameworks. So first one under delivery, let's look at the Wynyard Point. So Wynyard Point will take approximately 14 months to construct. And it's t it should be noted that uh, there would be complexity around the construction during have to work during to having to work in three different locations simultaneously. Um, the big issue around this option is it displaces major existing tenants on Wynyard Point, and I'm sure you can all understand who, we, who we're referring to up there. And that relocation requires those tenants' agreement, which will take um, an uncertain amount of time to reach an agreement, but it also opens the council to risk around renegotiation of those leases. This option also required the closure of Brigham Street because it utilised, uh, would utilise, and you'll see in event mode, um, the car park, which is known as the ASB car park, uh, which provides 220 car park spaces for ASB and 80 car parks to Sanfords. To link that car park to the water edge so you could launch the boat would require the closure of Brigham Street. Now that's going to trigger um, a significant process through LINS, through LGA, um, and we believe that that again, puts the council at significant risk. Um, again, this option requires dredging, 
and uh, dredging not only on the western side but um, some, some dredging on the eastern side. Moving to the, what we're calling now the, the Wynyard Basin option in delivery, construction time 10 months, so a little shorter. Um, there is some wharf extension, and we'll come to that under the, uh, under the, um, the base configuration. And it also displaces um, an existing tenant on Wynyard Wharf, which is the C-Link um, tenancy, which we would have to relocate. And we're proposing, and we'll come to that later in the presentation, on uh, re relocating them to the western side of Wynyard Point. Again, it requires dredging to provide the depth uh, that's required for the, the new class of boats, the AC-75s. Moving on to the Halsey extension under delivery mode, this is the longest 18-month construction time. Um, there is obviously a significant stakeholder opposition to wharf extension. It requires dredging again. It displaces fishing boats. Um, however, we, we would be um, relocating them uh, again to an agreed location. And um, just as a point of interest here, the fishing fleet does have to relocate, not on a regular basis, but at least a couple of times a year when we hold events in, in uh, the Halsey area. Um, so they, um, they have accommodated that, that type of requirement previously. And it would also require negotiation uh, with key stakeholders <coughs> On the water space access, now you can, as you can appreciate, you've got to move through this basin to get to the viaduct. Moving on to um, the event phase and the differences, and this is this probably highlights the differences um, more than any other sheet. So, again, starting with the Wynyard Point option in event mode, um, there would be opportunities for public engagement with the, with, with the teams, but more limited because the teams would be dispersed. Um, they're more remote, and uh, more remote particularly from existing infrastructure on North Wharf and Wynyard uh, and the viaduct. Um, we can um, provide accommodation for the J-class boats, for the super yachts in the, in the Wynyard Basin, and so um, there's an expectation that we'll have the full fleet of eight J-class boats coming. Now these are the old 1920s, 120-foot um, magnificent sailing craft. Uh, very, very expensive. Um, probably the most expensive way to go slow would be the way that Team New Zealand would describe <coughs> them. But they are magnificent. <laughs> and uh, the regatta, these regattas are held around the world. It would be part of that worldwide circuit and would attract enormous interest and effectively event in, a, in its own right. So. With each of these options, we can accommodate uh, the eight anticipated J-class boats that would arrive, um, and we can accommodate, um, in this option, nine super yachts in the, in the Wynyard Basin, as, we, as we're calling it. However, one of the key problems we have here is mitigating against wind and tide effects on that western side of the outer Wynyard Point, and that's, we believe, a considerable risk. As well as that risk that I mentioned earlier, um, with the um, renegotiation of existing leases around the car park space and most importantly getting approval from the adjoining uh, tenants, BST and Stolthaven, who are the bulk storage liquids operators and we don't really want to start uh, renegotiating or reopening uh, discussions around leases um, on Wynyard Point with those guys. The next option, Wynyard Basin. Uh, again, in event mode, uh, we believe this represents a great opportunity for the public to really get up close and see all of these bases in full operational mode, not only along North Wharf, which uh, would give you a great view of the bases operating <coughs> on Wynyard Wharf, uh, but also on Tewero Island and Eastern Viaduct, where you would also get a great vantage point of the teams in operational mode launching and retrieving boats. And uh, effectively, the, the public event space in the village would extend from the eastern viaduct at the base of Hobson <coughs> Wharf right to the base of Wynyard Wharf, and we're calling that the village, and that would incorporate all of the existing infrastructure, the food and beverage infrastructure, uh, and all the other activities that happen in that area in one great event space. We can accommodate uh, the, the nine super yachts, the J-Class fleet, and um, we've got everything closely located uh, in, a, in a pretty tight fashion. Again, um, concerns around wind and tide and uh, sea state conditions, which will require some significant breakwaters to be constructed 
um, one coming out from Wynyard Wharf and the, another one from Halsey Wharf back the other way to provide that new uh, sheltered water space which we're calling Wynyard Basin. Halsey Extension, uh, this one is um, uh, again a great opportunity for the public uh, to get engaged uh, with access uh, along the Eastern Viaduct, up Hobson Wharf, up Halsey Wharf, right around uh, the back of the bases to a vantage point at the end of the extension. Um, all of the bases would be very closely located. This is the tightest, tightest we can get them. Uh, it is centralised, and you, I, I think you would have to agree you can't get any more centralised than this in terms of logistics and <coughs> operations uh, and security. Uh, it provides the space for the 8J class, but more importantly, provides additional space for the super yachts, so we can get up to 28 super yachts, um, which has a significant um, benefit for us in terms of um, uh, economic return. In terms of the water state, uh, we are more confident around providing a sheltered water space with the mitigation that's required underneath that wharf structure um, to provide um, the, the quality of the water space uh, it, within the basin itself. And it should also be noted that will also improve the quality of the water space and what we call the outer viaduct, the existing outer viaduct, and the inner viaduct, which are both subject to, um, to wave conditions at the moment. And that's primarily due to the high-speed ferry which um, runs up to Birkenhead. Moving through to legacy, and again looking at each of those options in legacy mode, um, Wynyard Point uh, provides um, really an opportunity for the public to experience Wynyard Point. If they haven't been down there already, this would be a chance for them to get down there and understand what Wynyard Point's all about. Um, it would give us the opportunity to <coughs> relocate Sealink uh, potentially to a permanent home on the western side of Wynyard Point. Um, however, it does um, conflict with the establishment of the public open space, which we would, would, we would be seeking to start at the end or the expiry of the Stolthaven lease in 2022. So we, uh, that would preclude that public open space commencement, um, would prevent that from happening. And when you base an option, the legacy, um, the wharf structure in this location um, is, is uh, certainly less than what was proposed in the waterfront plan. So we could say that we are still compliant with the intent of the waterfront plan 2012. It would increase public access onto and to the water, uh, provide a new sheltered water space in the form of the Wynyard Basin. So that's that new space between Halsey and Wynyard, um, which North Wharf currently looks out into. <coughs> Excuse me. And again, Sealink would be relocated to uh, potentially a permanent location. On the third option, the Halsey Extension, um, this is consistent with the water plan, Waterfront Plan 2012 in terms of the extent of it. it, is, um, it uh, the footprint uh, extends out to the same limit line as the end of Prince's Wharf, which was clearly articulated in the Waterfront Plan 2012 and which was uh, supported and, uh, and adopted by Council back in 2012. Uh, it increases public access to and, and onto the water. It provides a significant new sheltered water space uh, to provide for the increasing demand on water-based recreation, tourist, commercial, marine sector, uh, educational, and all those events that, that, I, that I mentioned earlier to create a permanent home for Auckland's water-based events that we currently don't have. And again, we would, would provide the opportunity to, opportunity to relocate Sealink to a permanent home. We put in this slide because, um, again, with the introduction of the Wynyard Point option, councillors need to understand the risk to council of the impact on business as usual for each of these options. In Wynyard Point, we do have considerable impact um, with the removal of the concrete batching plant. So that's Auckland's CBD batching plant. So we would need to renegotiate a lease and find them another location somewhere in the CBD. It would prevent the planned development of Site 18, which um, ironically enough is earmarked for the refit haul out and refit of super yachts and other 
other large vessels, including black boats. So servicing of large vessels would be um, prohibited if, uh, if that option was to proceed. That is a significant loss in revenue. On the Wynyard Basin option, uh, business as usual, um, we would minimise the uh, impact on the construction activities. However, there would be some impact on those vessels entering and exiting uh, the existing viaduct area. And it would, with the introduction of those new seawalls or breakwaters to create that sheltered basin at the base of Wynyard, that would obviously limit the length of Wynyard Wharf going forward into the future. <coughs> so Wynyard Wharf is currently Auckland's longest wharf and uh, wharf space and berthage, as you understand, is incredibly valuable and sought after. So that would be uh, an impact of that particular option. <coughs> on the Halsey extension, um, the impact on business as usual is obviously those construction activities around or, or on um, those businesses and residents in the area. And we've got a growing residential community that, we're, that we are encouraging down in Winyu Quarter and obviously the construction impacts on uh, vessel access into the viaduct. So just to summarise that, and we've done a bit of a traffic light scoring on this uh, in, in terms of level of complexity. So high complexity equals high risk, and that's high risk in terms of time, impact on time and impact on cost. Mm. Uh, from red being high, the amber medium, and green being low complexity. So where you see a dot, there is a level of complexity, but we've attempted to um, rate each of these levels. So running across the top, we've got those, those parties that would be impacted, the Sanfords and the Auckland fishing, uh, fishing Fleet, Sanfords haul-out facility on Hamer Street, uh, the Sea Link operations, the Sea Plain operations, the bog liquids industries, Fletcher's, and that's the concrete batching plant uh, on the western edge of Wynyard Point, Viaduct Harbour, who um, operate the, the inner and outer viaduct, uh, the ASB car park leases, Site 18, which is earmarked for the super yacht and uh, black boat haul out, um, the Maritime, uh, Mar Maritime Museum, and Ports of Auckland. So then we look at each of those options, starting again with Wynyard Point, um, and really due to um, the impact on Sanford's western site on the western side of Wynyard Point and the removal of that, that would severely impact, or well, we believe it's a medium complexity uh, on, their, on their operations because that's where they haul out their fishing boats to maintain them, clean them and keep that fleet operational. And I'll just continue across Wynyard Point for each of these items then we'll drop down to the other, other, other items. Sea Link and the seaplane um, medium complexity, they would have to be relocated. Bulk liquids, a significant risk, again, because we would have to seek their approval to operate uh, um, or to change the use of the ASB car park and to close Brigham Street. Fletchers, same, same reason we'd be closing them, that, that batching plant down. No impact on, on or minimal impact on uh, Viaduct Harbour. An impact on that ASB car parking lease, size 18, which we've already talked about and the ports um, because they currently use that, uh, that Wynyard Wharf. In the Wynyard Basin, the risk to Sanford is lessened. There is some risk, but it is lessened um, because we're obviously taking uh, up some of the wharf space that they currently use for, their, for operating their fishing fleet. The same level of risk around Sea Link and the Seaplane, a lesser risk to the bulk liquids, um, a uh, medium risk to uh, Viaduct Harbour because we would have to be uh, in, in discussion with the operator of the Viaduct Harbour Marina, uh, a low level of risk to the Maritime Museum but still some risk, and again uh, medium risk to Port Company for impact on Wynyard Wharf. On the Halsey Extension there is still that risk, the same level of risk as the Wynyard Basin on the Sanford and Auckland Fishing Fleet. Um, there is the same level of risk around Sea Link and the Seaplane relocation. There is some risk to uh, Viaduct Harbour, again, because they uh, would be operating through um, the uh, conjoining water space. And then also a low level of risk with the Maritime Museum because Hobson Wharf would form the eastern uh, boundary of that particular option. 
I now move to um, where we have uh, arrived in terms of relocation of Sealink and uh, the fishing fleet. Um, and we have uh, come up with an option which still needs to be developed further, but it is uh, an option that we believe is workable. We've um, worked, with, worked with Becker and our hydrologists to look at the, um, the delivery or deliverability of this. And what this includes is that, that um, pink line or purple line, depending on what printout you've got in front of you, to the right-hand side is a wharf, but it is a solid wharf. So it has structure underneath it to act as a wave break to provide protection to the ramp, the, the, the ceiling ferry ramp, and the floating pontoons in yellow to the south. So we've got a, a breakwater with a wharf surface on it where, uh, where craft ferries could be tied up two on both sides depending on the, on the weather conditions and the tide conditions, uh, space for the ferry and pontoons for fishing, fishing boats and, uh, and black boats. So the, the estimate for the cost of uh, providing this, which is required under, the, uh, under each of the options, um, would be 18 million. That's our estimate for that. So we, when we come to the cost, which is the next slide, um, you'll see that we've, uh, we've figured that in there. So again, each of the three options talking about costs. When you'd point, which is our dispersed model, we estimate the delivery cost of 112 million uh, with an event overlay of 5.1 million, giving a total delivery cost of 117.1. Then on top of that, we have the uh, relocation costs of 18 million, however, the costs of the renegotiation and relocation of those major tenants uh, until we actually have those conversations is uncertain, but as you can appreciate, could be significant. What we can tell you is the financial impact to Auckland Council of that option. So the loss in rental income of that ASB Sanford car park, 3.5 million over the four years, 2018 to 2022. The loss in income from the commercial sites, 14.3 uh, over the same period, 14.3 million. And the opportunity cost lost um, for the Site 18 not being able to develop Site 18, 35 million. So significant costs. Moving to the Wynyard Basin option, the infrastructure delivery cost, 128. The event cost is slightly lower at 4.1. Total delivery for that uh, event of 132 plus the uh, 18 million relocation for the fishing fleet um, and the sea link and seaplane. And the Halsey extension, uh, the most expensive infrastructure, 159 uh, plus an event cost of 10.4, a total cost of 169.4 plus again that 18 million for the relocation of those uh, activities. Now, while we've been focusing very much on the America's Cup event, as we discussed in the workshop last week, uh, there is um, considerable interest to progress the works on Auckland's welcome mat, the waterfront, with the work to the seawall, to Key Street, uh, to ferry infrastructure, um, to the bus infrastructure, um, to ensure that all of these projects could potentially be delivered by 2021. Now, some of these projects are already captured under the, the long-term plan. The total cost for these projects is estimated at 220 million. So this would be additional cost uh, to the America's Cup costs that we've talked about. And that ends the uh, formal part of the presentation and uh, certainly open to take questions. <coughs> Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rod. Um, I'd like, first of all, to move pro forma the recommendations uh, with one alteration. Um, H, I'm asking or suggesting that we strike out because I require further discussions with the Minister before I put that forward. So I'll move that pro forma. Have I got a seconder for that? Second. Seconded from Richard Hills. Um, where we're going to go from here, um, I suggest we direct our questions, first of all, uh, to Rod and the team, and then we invite Team New Zealand to come forward and direct our questions separately to them. So, uh, 
Councillor Fletcher, you've got a, a, a question. Thank you very much, Mr Mayor. A um, couple of questions uh, to Rod, if I may. Can we go back to the summary cost breakdown paper just for a moment? And the infrastructure delivery cost column. On the 112 that you've got there for the Wynyard Point, can you tell me, is that just the infrastructure delivery cost? You haven't factored in the financial impact to Auckland Council. I just want to be quite clear on this. So, uh, you know, when we're looking at this, we want to be able to compare apples with apples. You must be able to give us some kind of guesstimate of what, in, in terms of that 112, we know that there is negotiation and relocation of major tenants. Um, if we were to try and scope any figure there so that we can have a very clear idea of what the actual options are in terms of costs. Can you answer that first? I've got a couple more questions. Councillor Fletcher, thank you. We have articulated the costs that we can be that we can give you with some certainty, which is on that right hand column. Yeah. So that's the car park, loss of income, loss of income from the commercial sites, uh, and the opportunity cost for not developing the, the super yacht refit yard. In terms of those other costs, in terms of relocating tenants and the negotiations that uh, might ensue, it's very difficult for us to estimate those costs. But we're just putting it in there. We'd have to be, would require more time to develop that. But until we have the conversations, we just don't know what those those costs could be. So, but in, they could be significant. In in reality, there's probably, you know, if you were trying to guess, and and I would imagine if you had a tenant in there and you knew you had to relocate them and the pressure was on, um, council could be held hostage. Correct. In terms of some of those costs. Correct. Yeah. Um, Second question for me was, it, it, I guess it comes down to the, the earlier traffic lights that you had and understanding um, the implementation complexity. Um, just how we arrived at what is going to be best for Auckland, because I note that in the officer's recommendations under... Um, B, there is um, an expression of preference for one option, and yet that doesn't necessarily measure up on all of the other criteria that we set for ourselves. So um, I, I'm wanting to understand that, and setting aside needs and wants of Emirates Team New Zealand, the needs and wants of Auckland long term, and coming back to the legacy, which, in your opinion, is going to give the greatest legacy to Auckland moving forward. If there is a scenario which, God forbid, that the defence is unsuccessful and this is to be utilisation of space for other purposes, try, you know, whatever, could you please give me a little more insight into the purpose of that space? Thank you. I, I, I think it comes back to the question of what do you consider legacy to be? Because you can measure legacy in, in many different ways. You know, is it, is it a, a legacy that, um, as I've said earlier, uh, creates this permanent water-based event space, which we don't have at present, and we consider that to be of, of value, and that's why it was outlined in the Waterfront Plan back in 2012. Um, do you consider a legacy to the public and their public's ability to get out and u utilise and enjoy the water? A legacy? We think so. Um, there'll, be, there'll be those who believe that um, there could be s significant environmental risk. We believe we can mitigate against that. And I'd also challenge the, uh, the notion that um, the waterfront plan was an ad hoc uh, approach to waterfront planning and it, I'll acknowledge that there have been some impacts on that planning since that plan was endorsed and approved by council in 2012 um, but I still believe that plan holds true. So my third and last question at this time, thank you Mr Chairman, is, is actually about a criteria that I would have liked to have seen included. I see Peter Busfield sitting behind you. I've taken a strong interest 
in the marine industry, to me, they're on a sort of parallel <coughs> journey as the wine industry in New Zealand in terms of putting us on the map and the things that we can do. What would be the best outcome or best option for the marine industry given the opportunities moving forward? Uh, I believe, um, for the reasons that we've already outlined in the presentation, the, the Halsey Wharf extension would provide the best legacy for the marine industry, uh, not only in terms of berthage uh, for super yachts, work boats, uh, the fishing fleet, but also the um, ensuring that that super yacht and black boat haul out facility was, was made available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Desley Simpson. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Fletcher has almost touched on my question. Um, I'm disappointed that the report didn't mention legacy for Auckland because whilst this is potentially a, a, a fantastic event, probably the be best we will have for a long time, um, I think that the decisions we need to make um, have, without doubt in my mind, have to be based around what is the long-term legacy for Auckland. So with Your Worship's indulgence, I either would like to add a, um, a recommendation or add to your um, to your F, is it your F? We're reporting back in December with a very clear indication that the preference is not just that what one which suits potentially the Crown and um, Emirates Team New Zealand for what they want to do, but it's very clear in what it's going to leave behind for Aucklanders. Um, I, I think that's the most important thing, and that's not mis that's not anywhere here in these recommendations. So um, I'll, I'll seek your guidance whether it could be added or <coughs> a separate one or, or to F as it stands. Yeah. Um, look, uh, look, the member's welcome to move anything by way of amendment, <coughs> but when I look at uh, you know, the things that we need to take into account, there's a whole lot of things. Legacy's important. Uh, so too are the economic <coughs> benefits of different <coughs> things. So too are the cost to council of different <coughs> options. <coughs> I'm kind of reluctant just to pull one out I agree legacy is very important, but there are a range of other things that are equally important that I think we need to. So I've, I've kind of kept the, the motion, <coughs> the resolution neutral on, on that aspect of it. Um, can, I, I, don't ha oh, I do have another question from uh, uh, Councillor Philippi, Deputy Mayor, Richard Hills, Vic Quacks, becoming fast and furious. Uh, <coughs> yep, that's a good start. Okay. Uh, oh, uh, thank you, Your Worship. Look, just around the super yachts, um, how much will that bring in in 2021? Can I come back to you on that? I do have the numbers. I just need to pull it up on, on my computer because it's, we've, we've done, the yeah, we've done numbers. Um, but I just wanted you to see it. Yeah. Okay, then I'll, I'll wait for that. So, so, so what is your hold that? I do <laughs> have them. I do have them now, Councillor. Okay. okay. Yeah. That's quick. Um, which which option? Because well, it does uh, depend which option. Yeah. Well, I, I, I mean, for me, when I when, when I looked at the report around 2021, it gave a figure there uh, around what it will bring, in, in in and that's just our super yachts will bring in. I've, I've also had a look through the uh, failure of Cup history as well. And, and I've looked through that, and I've got questions on that as well. But look, just just whatever figures you've got, really. Yep. There, there so are there's two that were mentioned in this. Yeah, so that we've got the figures in the report which talk about the benefits to the economy. Yep. And then the mayor asked the question over the weekend, what are the direct financial benefits to council in terms of income? So I can provide that information as well. So you already have the information in the report around the, the yep. 213 million benefit. Um, and then if we look at, firstly, the Halsey extension option, um, pre-event, so that's from July 2019 to June 2020, the income of the Super Yachts Act would be uh, accommodate would be 12 million. During the event itself, between July 2020 and June 21, that income jumps to 18.7 million because you can command a premium during the event time. And then ongoing, uh, post-event, 11.4 million. And that's on the Halsey extension. Now, for the same three periods for the Wynyard Basin option, pre-event, so that's July 19 to June 2020, 6.7 million. Um, during the event, 11 million. And ongoing, 6.4.
So that's just the revenue which is generated from berthage, from parking the boats there. Then there's additional revenues that come through from power, from providing diesel, internet, water services, providing services like removal of black water. There's all those additional services as well. Yep, so it is significant. Significant. So, yep. yep, no, def definitely. That's why I asked the question. Can I um, also, Rob, if I get, if you go to page 164, and I'm talking around, uh, again, for me, mana whenua, engagement and communication. So 164, under your 35, you, you've got Ngāti Whātou or Rākei and Pānuku mana whenua group. So who, how, how many mana whenua do we have on your Pānuku mana whenua forum? In the forum, we, we uh, officially have 14 groups. Ngāti Whātou uh, have declined of late to attend those forums, as, as you probably know. Um, so we've held not only um, workshops but a number of uh, discussions with uh, mana whenua around America's Cup. Um, and we have also held independent, um, to Councillor Darby's earlier question on the Dolphin, independent discussions with Narimu Blair and Rob Hutchison at Ngāti Fato Auraki. So, uh, and that's around um, not only their interests in the event, um, but also uh, their, their strong desire to be part of uh, a delivery proposal. Okay, and um, also questions still on mana whenua and, and, and iwi consultation. On page 173.78 is the number you've got Kaitiaki Forum, and you're asking for uh, a mandate from them. And, I mean, is, is that separate, I'm assuming, with the names? But that's separate, and how many mana whenua on the Kaitiaki uh, Forum, please? Yes, so all of the mana whenua who attend the forum did not sign up to that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, I will say my comment, and I've got one more yep. question, um, Your Worship, and that is around the... the 243, uh, right through to 251, and you've got failure of cup hosting. Um, now, the question for me is the comment around the risks, and this particular one is for San Francisco, I think. Yep, uh, page 245, San Francisco, 2013. They accounted for 15 teams and only got four. So, you know what I mean? How, how are we? And this may be a question for Stephen, uh, Sir Stephen... And uh, his, his associate with him. But how confident are we? I know I've heard you say there's about eight that possibly could be housed um, at, uh, within Auckland. Um, but how confident are you? Because we don't want to end up um, with, with what you've given with, uh, under the failure of cup hosting. So I'll be interested with that, please. I, I, I could answer, but I will, I'd prefer to leave that to Sir Stephen, who can give you much more uh, surety around that than I could. So, Chair, can I save that yep. particular question when uh, both the gentlemen come up, please? Yep. Uh, thank you, Councillor Filipino. Uh, just to bring you into a picture, um, I did meet with Ngāti Whātua earlier this week, and they expressed a preference for the B1 option, the, the cluster around the basin. Uh, we will be meeting with mana whenua generally, uh, over the next fortnight. So we have that at the forefront of our minds as counts, from council point of view, as well as what uh, officials are and, doing. And, and, and Chair, just to comment there, because I, I was going to save it until I speak, yeah. and I will save the majority of what I want to say, but just in response to what you've said, uh, nothing is better than, than, than obviously um, negotiation individually, uh, mm. if we can. And I think that's the point of my concerns I have under the Māori impact statement. Um, so, look, I, and I'll save my uh, rest of my comments till other uh, speaking. Thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Deputy Mayor, Bill Cashmore. Oh, thank you, Mr Mayor. <coughs> so, very quickly, so we've got a difference between the Halsey Extension and the Wynyard Basin for the super yachts income of around 18 million. What is the difference in the actual construction or provision of those berthages between those two options? Well, the, um, there's approximately nine berths in the uh, Wynyard Basin yep. and 28 berths provided in uh, the Halsey extension. So and the third. But is there a construction cost attached to that? Yes, there for a is. Figure? Yeah, there is. So it'll be three times the cost to yeah. provide the, the berthage. Right. And I... Yeah. It's... Yeah. It's buried in here. Through you, Mr Chair, that's why the event cost for Halsey Wharf is more. It's 10 it's million. included in that? Yep. Yeah, correct. as opposed okay, cool. to four. 
My, my second and probably last question is the 220 million for the other projects, what number of those, what is the sum total of those that aren't budgeted for? And a commentary on Tiwero Bridge, please. Yeah, the, the, the quantum that's not budgeted for is 90 million, I believe. Correct. Yep. There's 120 million provided for, there's 90 million not currently budgeted. Uh, there's some degree of complexity in those numbers. Um, of the 120, you'd have to bring some forward because it's spread over a 10 year period. So if the objective was to complete those works prior to the America's Cup and APEC, then you'd need to bring some of that Certainly. capital forward as well as the additional 90 million. In the bridge, do you worry? To Faro Bridge? Yeah. 40 million. 40. Yeah. 40 million. Yeah, 35 to 40. That's budgeted for? No. Zero or not? No. 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 On top of that. So okay. that's on top of the 220. Uh, that's, that's in the 220. So that's, are you sure? Mm. No, it's not. No, it's, no, it's not inside the. No, it's not. Correct. I didn't think it was. It's not inside the. I thought that was the point of the deputy no, it's it's the In effect. Um, yeah, look, yeah. Can, can I just throw in a, a, a couple of questions quickly before uh, going down the list? Um, I'm just wondering whether you could explain to councillors uh, in regard to the Winyard Point option why removing a concrete batching plant is high complexity and the ASB car park lease. They are two, two, two usages that you think you could duplicate somewhere else pretty easily. So could you, could you address that question please? Certainly. The concrete batching plant is quite unique in that it's the only batching plant in the CBD and finding an alternative location, an industrial location in the CBD is going to be quite difficult and that would become Council's responsibility to do that. So we believe that it, that is a significant risk. Sorry, could I, can I just clarify that answer? Why does it have to be in the CBD? Because it's supplying the CBD projects and that impacts directly the cost of construction in the CBD. Yeah, but I see concrete trucks going up and down the roads into the city all the time. I They're mean, probably coming from, from Winnie Quarter. Uh, a no, lot no, of no, not, not unless they've gone via, via Manarewa. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just genuinely interested in that one. I've been down there. I don't know why some really valuable land is being used for a batching plant in the centre of the city. That's, that's a lease which has been in place for some considerable time. We've inherited it. Yeah. Yeah, but there isn't, uh, you know, what I guess I'm trying to explore, is there any reason why that can't be placed somewhere else? It could be. All we're saying is there is a financial and a, and a risk okay. to time as well and in negotiating that. Can you explain the difficulties? Car the park, park is even more complex because it requires the approval of the adjoining neighbours, which is BST and Stolthaven. And as soon as we uh, open negotiations with them, there is a significant risk of impacting on their current lease agreement which is around the bulk liquid storage. So they could play games with it and push Correct. the cost up. Correct. Correct. My, my second... So, uh, an impact on cost and time. And too. time. Yep. Yeah. No, yep. no, I, I understand that. Yep. Um, just if we're trying to compare apples with apples and what the total cost of the three options are, just, just tell me if these figures are right. The total cost of Wynyard Point, including the cost to council, is about $170 million. Add, I'm, I'm just adding the figures together. Yes, I that's know right. So that's the 128 plus the, the eight, 18 or so uh, and, the, and the event. And yep. the Halsey Street yep. Wharf extension, 169, about the same. Correct. <coughs> and the, the Wynyard Basin, 132. Correct. So that's, that, that's, the, that's the cheaper option. Can I just raise a question about time for construction because um, I have the time for two of those options. Halsey Street is 18 months. Correct. Uh, the Wynyard Basin is 10, 10 months. Yes. Do you have any idea of Wynyard Point? 14. 14. Yeah, okay. It should have been in the presentation material. Uh, yeah, yeah, mate, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. I think that's right. Yeah. So if you were just doing it on cost time. and time, then there's some advantage in the, the Wynyard Basin option. Correct. But Thank also you. caveat the, um, the Wynyard Point disperse model uh, because of the, the reasons that I explained to Councillor Fletcher, there's some costs in there which are and time impacts which are undeterminable until we have those engagements. That, that could be ad additive costs. Yeah, correct. Okay. No, no, I think that's, that's a useful point to know. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Richard Hills. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a few questions. So obviously I'm quite happy that we're coming down to the Wynyard Basin model as the preferred, but still 
and I know it's not designed and we've talked about it before, but could you maybe explain generally what we can expect for what it could look like, what is going to be on these spaces? Obviously, we don't have any 3D imaging, but a lot of people are asking. And it kind of, um, what will it look like? Also, we talk about legacy, but we're obviously hoping to win. So there will be another, in four or five years or three years, there will be another competition here. So okay. what would we be expect that this will look like between... Um, you know, winning cups because we're going to keep winning them. Okay, um, we, we prepared last night some images which depict both the Halsey extension and the Wynyard Basin options in both event and legacy mode. So perhaps if we just start, so that's, um, we'll just start an event mode for each of them. Oh, I've only, oh, only got legacy mode, okay. <laughs> so here's the, um, the Wynyard Basin option in a post event and legacy mode with a wharf structure which would be used for four events, water-based events. Uh, we've got uh, super yacht and fishing uh, accommodation on the western side and within the, within the Viaduct Basin as we do now. Uh, we've got a sheltered water space with those, uh, with those breakwaters that have been uh, located. Uh, we've got, um, as I said, the, uh, the, what we're calling the Wynyard Point Public Park now, uh, the four and a half hectare public open space and the adjoining uh, mixed-use development and marine industrial uses, and really completing that uh, Wynyard Point, Wynyard Basin, Halsey water space story, uh, including Tawero and the Eastern Viaduct. So that, that's the comprehensive build-out with people having access to all of those spaces, so public access to the water edge and enjoyment of the water edge. Um, and so, so to my question again, what, what does that look like if we if we've won, so we want to be repeating, will we? Is so those are those are those are just flat decks yeah. with temporary occupation. The only permanent building uh, would be <coughs> the existing VEC, and a permanent building that Team New Zealand would like to leave as a legacy for maritime use uh, on the end of Hobson Wharf. Yeah. So, so it's effectively an extension to the Hobson Wharf development. But with that's assuming we kind of don't win, because obviously potentially in four years we'll be repeating the same. Yep. So, so, you so it's going to be flexible that we can rebuild everything again in three years' time or four years. Or you might decide to retain the structures that you've put up there right. for yep. this challenge. Okay, thank and you. again, that comes to the question of whether council delivers those structures and has control over those structures, or you leave it to the teams to build those structures. Yeah. So that's to my next question, thankfully. Um, maybe give us an idea of what are the potentials of and the pitfalls of doing it ourselves or having a little bit of design control because it's out on the, on the harbour or what it is if we leave the teams to do it? Do you okay, well, I, I guess the, the easiest point of reference is to the previous cup defences in 2000, 2003, and you'll recall the structures that were built for those, uh, for those events. Uh, we're looking at similar size structures, so structures that are 15 metres approximately in height. Um, to accommodate the, the, the type of boat and depending on whether it's a, a single base um, between um, 38, 40 metres wide in single base up to maybe 65 metres in width and 70 metres long. So uh, the, the building wouldn't be 70 metres long, that's a building in a yard, uh, but they're significant buildings. We haven't designed them uh, and that would be the next phase that we'd like to enter into. So how do we... If, if we are in control of delivering those buildings, how would we design and procure and deliver those in a way that um, would lend themselves to uh, use in the intervening years? And um, the other thing, and I've, we've touched on it before slightly, but what would be the types of kind of constraints we're putting on people for entering the space? Obviously, we spend a lot of money down there making this a pedestrian cycle kind of focus, but with a lot of traffic I assume going back and forth yep. during construction and um, during the event, which is fair enough. But what what kind of things can we do to make sure this is a still a walkable, kind of enjoyable, safe space for people of all ages? Well, councillors, as you can appreciate, we have become quite adept at managing the space down there in, in various construction modes, with opening and closing and redirecting traffic and moving moving things around. And we would employ that management technique going forward. So we would encourage the teams where possible and we're, we're, one of the things we'd look at is a, um, perhaps the development of a shuttle service to get crews down there so they don't have to bring cars down, uh, encourage the use of public transport not only from the teams but also from visitors coming down, 
encourage people to walk in, and that's, that's been a continual strategy to use the car parking structures that are outside the area. Um, and if you're a local, walk, walk into the, the event. So I encourage walking, cycling, use of public transport, shuttle service potentially, and minimise the use of private motor vehicles. However, there will have to be some vehicles that'll be servicing the needs of the bases. But just like we do with, with, um, with heavy vehicles now, uh, through that area, um, servicing the industrial area, servicing the viaduct event centre, servicing the fishing fleet, we're, we're well used to handling that, that level of traffic. And my last question, so you've, it's great to see there's a general kind of indication there'll be public space around the, the bases. Is that fine with Team New Zealand? Do you think that's sticking in there? And how big will those, because obviously there's going to be some secrecy, not secrecy, but protection of yep. um, the bases, but how do we manage the public space on the other sides and around those bases? Is that secured? Is that something that everyone's happy with? So obviously the <coughs> within the base compounds, the, the public wouldn't be um, able to, to get into that, but just as the bases were on Halsey Street previously, you can have access along the backs of the bases and into the bases in the controlled environment because a, a lot of the teams will be wanting to invite the public in to um, see the teams, to check out the merchandising. There'll be food and beverage or other hospitality opportunities. But that blue dashed line shows the extent to which the public could move around the bases. So in this option, the bases are secure into the water on the inside, so the public can't go up on the inside, but it's certainly all around the outside, get to those advantage, or to the vantage points at the entrance um, to this new harbour, um, along uh, Eastern Viaduct, Tuero, around the Viaduct Event Centre, and up Hobson Wharf. And the, the other, the sort of the preferred option that we're going for? Yep. So again, similarly, um, Eastern Viaduct, Tuero, around uh, the VEC, and along the outside edge of that uh, extended Halsey Wharf. And that's definitely secured as public space? So. Definitely for public space. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Vic Quakes. Yeah, thank you. Um, just wanted to ask you, because uh, there's been some uh, chatter uh, within my ward that uh, the Sea Link uh, business would be relocated to Half Moon Bay. Uh, according to what you've shown us here, that is not the case. Can you just assure us that that is actually the case, that they won't be real, that we won't be having a big industrial site down at Half Moon Bay? I can assure you that we uh, will be required to relocate the Sea Link Ferry on a like-for-like -like basis uh, in, a, in a close by location to where they're currently located. Thank you, thank you very much. Can I just ask a question about security? Um, because in this day and age um, of, uh, of terrorism, and, and we can never be, we can never consider that ourselves to be immune from the possible terrorism. Would who would the ultimate be ultimately be responsible for the security of this uh, event? Um, I would, again, defer to Team New Zealand on that one. <coughs> um, once the location um, of the bases has been confirmed, there will be a host agreement, which I'm sure will cover um, items such as uh, security and, and managing the space during event mode, but I'd, I'll defer to, to Team New Zealand on that one. Okay, thank you. Um, and again, going back to the security uh, issue, uh, is there any difference in the security um, uh, operations of the various sites? Again, I'll, I'll defer to Team New Zealand, but my initial thinking as I, as I outlined in the presentation is it would be easier to make a single site secure than a dispersed site. And I, I include the, the Wynyard Basin because there are some bases which are not co-located, so it just increases um, the cost and, and complexity around security. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Linda Cooper. Uh, just, um, it, it sort, sort of relates to what Dick's saying around the more dispersed mos model, the preferred option that's um, being discussed here. You've got a real village feel in this, in the Housie Street extension, but you've got these um, bases over the other side, which I'm quite <coughs> concerned about the public access there. Um, there's already a public road there. We've talked about the fact that that was 
the wind yard point option, the road would have to be closed, but my concern is having bases there might not be as safe for public access. It doesn't show any public access. And so, you know, there's an expectation, I would have thought, by the general public that they could access the whole, the whole area, but this looks like it's cut off. One, two, and three are cut off from public access, given the fact that it's in a hazardous site, um, as we know, hazardous materials, public car parking coming up and down there. Can you just work me through whether the public have got access to that or not? So the, the road, which is a public road, is obviously accessible to the public and open for um, use of the businesses that are located down there. Um, we believe that that public access would have to be managed in terms of limiting numbers. We wouldn't be encouraging large numbers of people to congregate down there because of that risk that you've highlighted. So while we've got North Wharf and down to Silo Park um, and, uh, and Halsey Wharf totally um, accessible to the public, I think we would have to manage that, that Wynyard, uh, that southern end of Wynyard for the very reasons that you outlined. So some... Um Syndicates might be a bit disadvantaged in terms of having that bars and merchandising, they, they et cetera, could be. Et cetera. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, Councillor Chris Darby. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, three questions, and thank you, Rod, for your work. Um, just in terms of there's some discussion about legacy, and that's important, the legacy left. Um, I'm interested in the, the legacy that's inherited here, and I just wanted to understand, uh, from your point of view, how you have understood that context of the legacy we've inherited, the natural legacy of water basin that's there, the recreational values attached to that, and the cultural values attached to that. So how have you viewed that and valued it um, um, along with the legacy that uh, endures? So the legacy inherited, which is legacy lost potentially, against the legacy lasting. Um, it, it's a really good question and a very difficult question to answer because everybody has uh, a different view on legacy, as I've outlined earlier. I'm a, a fellow yachty and I value the harbour and enjoy using it and um, feel very passionate about Auckland's um, ability to provide <coughs> what is arguably one of the best sheltered <coughs> harbour spaces in the world. Um, I think for me personally, um, it's about uh, the possibility or the potential of adding value to something that's already very valuable. So that, that water space does have value. It is as, as an open space, as a, as a natural amphitheatre and, and effectively a bay, that does, does have some value. However, um, as I said earlier, we, um, we can add value to that space without, without um, or through mitigation, without damaging the impact on it, we can add value to create a space which is more usable by the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I'm talking about is this event space, the space that people can get out onto and into a sheltered water space. Because um, that, as it is, it's valuable because <coughs> it is open and it's unobstructed, um, but it is not controlled. It is just a piece of moving harbour water. What we're saying is it could be more valuable and more usable if it is um, if it is shaped and formed and controlled in some way. Okay, thank you, Rod. Second question: um, I think I'm not sure what the date is next year that the Challenger has the cutoff for. Uh, I think um, it's I think it's June. It's June. June. So by that date, we're proposing um, up to eight. Um, bases here of varying sizes, doubles and singles. If by June next year there were only, say, five or six challenges, <coughs> is there room to amend the design so that we're not building out the maximum for a, an eight or an eight um, challenger series? There is. There is. There is. Okay. And we would, we would just have to um, council and with Team New Zealand agree where the best location for those bases would be for that legacy value. Thank you, and I'm not suggesting that might end up to be the case. And last question is, what soundings, um, this is on the back of some suggestion that the, the public money of council, government, and possibly private sector investment here, 
what soundings have been made of the private sector if they were to invest uh, in this physical infrastructure? And what, what commercial return would they be expecting? Um, I probably need to understand what building sites they might be looking for on the, the quasi-public areas um, that we're promising here. Uh, so to answer your first question, there is considerable interest from the private sector. However, um, we really can't further any conversation with them until we've agreed a location and what that, um, what the uh, the configuration of the infrastructure is going to be, because that will then determine if there is any opportunity, commercial <coughs> opportunity. So they're they're waiting with interest on a decision from councillors around location. Okay, thank you, Chief. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Councillor Newman. With respect to the dispersed clustered option, I'm trying to understand um, the relationship between the individual syndicates and the access to those the areas where those syndicates are based. And so just confirming um, Syndicate 4 on there, Syndicate 4, even though it's at Halsey, really because of the way in which that's facing and designed, bears no relationship to Syndicates 5, 6 and 7 at Halsey. And then Syndicate 8 is separated again, it's not at Halsey, that's... And then um, 1, 2 and 3 are completely removed again. So what's the... Um, apart from the fact that I have concerns about um, the syndicates really not having any sort of relationship with each other and, and the disadvantages of that. Uh, what is the walkability experience for the people who want to participate uh, in the activities down there? In fact, they really don't have much of an option unless they go on a walking tour that can take them over quite an extended period uh, area, don't they? Mm. Um, <coughs> is there, um, uh, with respect to with respect to Syndicate Four, there is no there is no other feasible way. I suppose that we could look at they, there could be any sort of connection there to anywhere else on on Halsey for that syndicate. There is no no room sufficient to accommodate them. And what would be, is that syndicate for, is there room there, is, is there room in that one for a, a two-boat challenge, or are they, are they just the one? So I'll just run through the configuration. So syndicates one, two, and three are the single-boat yep. challenges um, with minimal public access for the reasons that we, we, we discussed, or Councillor Cooper asked the question on. Yeah. Um, syndicate four, five, six, seven, and eight are all doubles. And we've worked with Team New Zealand to look at different ways of configuring doubles, incurring the least amount of space possible on Halsey. So this is, this is the smallest possible extension we can do to accommodate those doubles on, on Halsey. If the, if the, and I'm not a, a yachty, but if the, if one of the fundamental arguments in favour of, of a clustered option is the, is the advantages of effectively you know, sharing the relationship between the syndicates and the tools and machinery and technology. Um, is that an option for Syndicate 4 in the dispersed? No. Okay, and there's no option for Syndicate 8? No. So the only option, the only advantages I suppose would be for Syndicate 5, 6 and 7 at Halsey and maybe some benefit to 1, 2 and 3, the smaller syndicates on the other side? Although you could argue that Syndicate 4, so if you just flip back to the other one, um, uh, is, it, it is co-located in a physical sense. So if, if you're a member of the public walking out Halsey Wharf, you're going to be sharing the same experience as being adjacent one to the other. You just wouldn't see the activity as the boats are being launched and retrieved because it's obviously happening in a different piece of water space. Right. So that's, this, that's the, the difference between the dispersed and then having it all being launched and retrieved in, in one water space and that sort of theatrical experience, if you like. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mike Lee. I th uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Rod. Um, thank you for the briefing. I, I have had some experience in this area over the years and I do appreciate objectivity, so thank you. Um, 
In, in terms of uh, congestion and traffic movement, we, we've heard about the, the car park and a walk around the area uh, indicates there's a lot of cars parking there now. Obviously, there's going to be more activity, um, more people working there, and certainly more people living there. And I just wonder, in terms of people moving, um, going back to that original waterfront plan, which had a lot of public support, whether um, Panuku is, is thinking again uh, about Te Wero in terms of uh, efficient public transport pe people movement. Councillor Lee, you, um, yeah, this is a, a really good and perennial question mm. and um, <laughs> it's one that it does constantly challenge us and uh, together with Auckland Transport. So what, what I, uh, I can say is that we are still in negotiation with Auckland Transport around public transport and I'm talking light rail and bus services in to Wynyard Quarter and the configuration of that, the routes and, and what that public transport would be and we are, um, we are strongly advocating for public transport along that um, Tuero alignment um, but as you know Auckland Transport struggled to build a, a, a case around that but we, we've got some other thinking around that okay. Councillor. Thank you, yeah. but you've actually cued me into the next point <laughs> I was going to make and that was not really a question of you cause, because it would probably be unfair but a question for all of us, is it time especially for this event uh, to integrate decision making around uh, Pānuku to give you a deal of control over that area without having to negotiate and I understand negotiations with other CCOs have been going on for many years now and not always um, constructively. So it's something for us, I think, to move this event ahead to give some integrated control and power to Pānuku um, to make sure that this thing works well and cohesively. Thank you. Question. Right, uh, question. Councillor Wayne Walker. Yeah, um, just one small question. I have a question around the Winyard point option, could you flick to that? Okay, <laughs> so in respect to some of the things that have to be negotiated and that Stolt Haven and the ASB car parking, have you had any preliminary negotiations, some explorations around that? No. No, I think as soon as we um, as soon as we alert those parties to the possibility, um, I think it really does um, weaken, weaken our negotiation position. So no, we haven't been anywhere near them yet. There's no point in going anywhere near them and alerting them to an issue if it's not going to be an issue. Well, I guess I beg to differ. I mean, if we're... If we're so, serious. Sorry, Councillor, can we have okay. a question? Okay. Not, uh, if we're not a big to differ. If we're, if we're serious about options that minimise the disruption to our harbour space, and that is our legacy, does it not follow that we should be exploring options that comply with that as much as possible? And the cat's out of the bag. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've got the question. We won't hear about the cat. Uh, Rod? For industry. As I said earlier, we have quantified the costs that we know in terms of the relocation um, of uh, certain businesses. The, the, the two businesses we haven't quantified yet are the concrete batching plant with Fletcher, uh, the relocation of Sanford and ASB car parking spaces, um, or any uh, discussion with the bulk storage around either the car park or the closure of Brigham Street. So those are those are the three three parties that we haven't been in, in discussion with. Okay, so I've got a further question that goes to this. If this meeting gave you a directive to explore those options, to have some preliminary negotiations with those parties, could those preliminary negotiations occur fairly quickly and could we hear back from you in some speed that might enable us to progress those options if the feedback was good? If it was Council's desire that that was a favoured option, sure, but I, 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 we're looking to Council to give us direction around the preferred option which will then determine a course of action. 
I guess it's a chicken and egg situation. I mean, if you, if you don't ask the question and you don't get the answer, you don't know. So really, I don't know what to do there, Mr Chair. No, but no. I would suggest that an option that enhances the legacy of preservation of the harbour is probably quite a desirable option as far as Aucklanders are concerned. That, that, that's good. That's an expression of opinion, not the, a question. The um, other question I've got... Please uh, come to it goes to the size of the bases, which I understand is around 35 by 35 metres and 35 by 70 for the, for the double. Is it conceivable that those sizes could be uh, less than that? And I'm basing that around experience looking at other America's Cup events and talking to um, sailors and others in those events where there were often considerably smaller spaces involved. Mm. You're right, and um, it, the discussion is at very early stage. The, the boat, as you know, has only just been revealed, so we've, we've got some um, some, some real dimension. Well, it's not only just the length of it, but it's also the width and the appendages and the, the length of those appendages, the widths of the boat. Um, but already, we've, with the discussions that we've had with Team New Zealand, there has been some refinement of thinking. So as we move into the develop design phase, you're right. These things will change, and I'm sure we'll be able to refine them and tighten them and tweak them to make it work more efficiently. But at the moment, with the information we have, we've got to work um, on the conservative side because we don't want to be coming back to you and saying we actually need more space than what we're proposing at sure. this, this meeting. But um, given that we know that the boats, I think, don't have wings, so in some respects they're more compact... No. They do have wings. No, they do. They do. I'm wrong, they, they do have they wings. Do. But, they do. Got wings. Yeah. but you yeah. add them they on, yeah. don't you? They're like big seagulls. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah. they go under for yeah. docking. They tuck in underneath. So yeah. how soon are we going to get a better idea of what the space requirements are? Uh, well, if we get approval to, to crack on with the, with the documentation, then we'll be moving straight into that immediately. Okay, thank you. Um, I've, I've got a question, and it, it's a concern as, a, as well as a question, but... Um, I think it needs to be clear to councillors that these figures have changed from the original figures, yep. Rod. Correct. That the Halsey Street extension now goes 230 metres out into the harbour. Is that correct? 220. 220. 230. Uh, uh, okay. Yep. Uh, and the, the smaller extension goes out 75 metres. Can you explain 70, why... 73. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 73, to be better. that's precise. Why were those changes made, and what confidence can we have that there's not further creep? The reason that um, the, uh, the Wynyard Basin option Halsey return has increased is that we wanted to ensure that we didn't have to put bases on the ASB car park, and that's... That's really the bottom line. If we wanted to keep bases out of the park, car park, we had to put single bases on Wynyard Wharf so we could keep them on the exist spanning between the existing outer edge of the wharf and the road, which meant all the double bases had to go onto the wharf. And that's, that's the only reason. So the 73 metre wide strip on the outside of the existing Halsey Wharf is to accommodate the bases and a 10 metre wide um, public access strip along the outside, which is that uh, that blue line you see in the graphic. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Alf Filipina. Thank you, Wish. Um, Rod, there was a slide you put up there, and it may have been the high-level risks, and there was four boxes in there, and I think you said that if we don't deliver the bases, there's not going to America's Cup. Is, can you confirm that that's exactly what I heard you say? I, I think it's before that. Carry on. Yeah, mm. and, 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 <laughs> and. Back to the wing. <laughs> ah, go, go back. back. Go black, please. The <laughs> delivery, I think the criteria categories, I remember you saying that if that doesn't get done, yeah. there's no America's Cup. Can you confirm that that's exactly what you said? Yeah, if we can't deliver it. Okay, no, yeah. no, I, and, but, but, but deliver it in particular is that the basis, isn't it? So if we can't deliver the basis, there's no. America's Cup. Correct. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm going to take the last question from Councillor Clow and then we're going to invite Team New Zealand to the table. So, Councillor Clow. Yes, I want to hear from Team New Zealand. Mine's a very basic one. The uh, Viaduct Event Centre, That's that will be hired out from when to when and um, is that 
is that a net cost to RFA? And what is the opportunity cost of them being forced to not have that in their portfolio for three or four years? Yeah. First question, um, I'm anticipating it would be from the end of 19 through to some time after America's Cup, so early 2021. Um, and we've had a conversation with RFA around that. So um, until the host agreement has, has been finalised, we're just not sure what the arrangement would be with RFA from a commercial <coughs> basis. So um, we can confirm that once that hosting agreement is finalised. Dean, did you want to say any more on that? No, it would come out in the hosting agreement as part of um, those arrangements with the Challenge of Record and Emirates Team New Zealand. I, uh, it's been said to me, and if you could confirm, so that's the question, that RFA <coughs> are certainly under financial pressure now and coming into the 10-year budget. There's no question that I got the impression from them that this would hit their budget quite considerably going forward. Is that true or not? Uh, yeah. Uh, Look, I, I think know. that we just we need a chance to work through know. that, yeah. Councillor yep. Clough. Right. I, I don't know the answer to which, uh, the extent to which it would affect the RFA bottom line, but if not managed well, it will. Yeah. So it's possibly a, a cost. Yeah. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. Depending on what rent might be paid for it. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank, thank you very much, Rod and team, uh, for that. That's been quite an extensive period of questioning. Can uh, I just... Uh, ask maybe two of you to move to one side and uh, if I can invite uh, Kevin Shoebridge and Sir Stephen Tyndall to the table. So welcome. It's uh, good good to have you here, Sir Stephen and Kevin. Um, thank you for making yourself available for questions. This is a, a unique opportunity for us. Uh, before we move to questions, is there any opening comment that you'd, you'd like to make? Yeah, I'd like to thank Panuku for the massive amount of work they've put in. Um, I think we've been incredibly impressed right the way through how Auckland Council and they in particular have responded to all the various machinations of what's been going on. Thank, thank you. It's, uh, it's been a challenging task for the team, uh, uh, I agree. Uh, questions from, uh, from councillors. I've got Al Filipina followed by <coughs> Southwood this week. I think our question was much the same. I reserved it, but I'll, I'll wait. Let's see. Sure. Two six. Um, tēnā kōrua, Sir Stephen and Trevor, is it? Kevin. Kevin, Kevin, Kevin. Kevin. Yep. Uh, Trevor's brother. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's Look, um, the, the, the question is the one that I that that, that I uh, asked earlier because I read in the the um, failure of the cup hosting around San Francisco. So, how how sure are you that with the the eight that we've been given, um, San Francisco, as you know had uh, accounted for 15 teams and ended up with four. So that was a big loss. So how, how sure are you or confident um, that, that we will get the, the people who have indicated so far that they will be here? Uh, well, that San Francisco prediction was never realistic from day one, that's for sure. But um, basically where we're at at the moment, our official entry is open on the 1st of January. Uh, already we've got... Uh, the four major teams have already committed to us, which is obviously ourselves, uh, Luna Rossa, uh, New York Yacht Club, uh, Ben Ainsley Racing from the UK. Um, we've got uh, a couple sitting on the fence, Artemis Racing from Sweden. Uh, we've been approached by another couple from the USA, another couple from Italy. Um, so we're we're reasonably, well, we're very confident we're going to get to that number, um, especially after the announcement of the yacht yesterday. It seems to have really spurred on a lot of teams who are sitting on the fence to make sure that the new class provided the excitement and the innovation, the technology that the last um, AC has. So reasonably confident, very confident. Okay. Okay, thank you. Your you, 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 you Worship, I, I, I then need to ask a question through you. Yep. 
Because all this is based on eight. The preferred option is, is eight, mm -hmm. double. So if we end up getting more than that, where do we go from there? That, that's that's that, the question. That, that's, I, that's, I, the, that's the other side of the coin, it, it, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, there, there may be four. I just posed that. Yeah. I Kevin don't know Kevin whether there's anybody like to, to answer it, but that. That, that's been a concern yeah. as a result maybe, maybe of what right. I asked. It would be a nice problem to have, um, and obviously we'd like to accommodate them if we could, but if we can't, there's provision in the protocol that we can actually limit entries. Okay. So it becomes a first-in, first-served situation. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Is it, uh, just to add to that question, is it an alternative that if after you've got number eight, somebody else comes along late, do you say, well, fine, but you find your own base? Yeah. That's a possibility as well. Uh, maybe you have one less double base and two single teams can go into one of those bases, for example, so there might be ways to stretch it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Chris Fletcher. Well, well, thank you very much. I've, I've got a, just a few quick questions. Um, Kevin, I've, I've followed America's Cup very closely over a long period of time and um, I took the opportunity of going up to San Francisco. I, I, I'm very quick to say, at my own cost, I don't think I've ever travelled anywhere on council, um, <laughs> that why was, that. in your opinion, the San Francisco village just so unsuccessful? I could tell you why I thought it was unsuccessful, but could you explain for us, uh, from your perspective, whether, it was, whether they were able to convey the village atmosphere? There, there was a couple of reasons, I think. Mainly, um, the teams were very spread out. They were they were spread out right along the San Francisco foreshore, probably over five kilometres, I would say. It was a long walk from one end to the other, over 40 minutes, perhaps. Um, the village was also... Uh, they had one central village right at the bottom um, uh, by the, the ferry building, but they also had a secondary village, which was right up by Golden Gate Bridge. So there was... Everything was split. Um, and it was quite fragmented, um, didn't draw a lot of public because of it. And so what was the impact of that on public interest? Because you might argue, well, you've, you've got television rights and things, people can see this. What actually happened to the public interest internationally and within the USA because of that? Yeah, I, I think inter internationally it was fine, but, but locally it suffered. Um, a lot of people in San Francisco didn't even know the event was on. Yeah. Um, so, second question is quickly, um, why do teams like coming to New Zealand? Uh, it, it's considered the, the, the second home of the America's Cup, I guess. I, I think everyone looks back to 2000 and 2003 and saw what an amazing um, couple of summers those were. Uh, the facilities on shore, the racing offshore, and, and the huge interest from the public, which is the, the, probably the main driving factor. You heard my colleague uh, Dick Quacks ask questions around security. Can you explain to me, um, you know, on the security side of things, um, if, if we are to see any kind of dispersed model, how, how the accountability for the security for that? Uh, <coughs> I think that'll be part of the post-city agreement, and I think it'll, I mean, it'll involve the police and everybody, so it's a little bit early for us to, to give you any details at this point. Okay, and finally, um, I just want to be quite clear, um, when we talk about free public access to the village, it will be that, is that your expectation? Uh, again, haven't discussed that, but absolutely that's the intention, yes. Yeah, thank you very much for that. I mean, I'd love to ask some questions of Peter Busfield as well in terms of just what the super yachts will bring, but uh, we'll save that for another day. Well, thank you very much. Just ask a supplementary to the first question asked by uh, Councillor Fletcher. When you say that the San Francisco village was far apart, was it two minutes apart like the Wynyard Basin or was it, you know, a, a great distance apart. Ah, uh, no, it was further than that. The, the two the two separate villages were probably 10 minutes apart, for example, and okay, the bases so were further, yes. That's quite different from any of our options, actually. Yes. Yep. Yep. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. Oh, my question was similar to Councillor Fletcher's around a dispersed model. Um, so I don't need to ask okay. it now, thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor John Watson. I think you, you, you see all, all our attention here today is uh, focusing around the, the base. Um, have you settled on a, a, a course yet? Is it similar to the last one or, or 
it, could it, be different. It will be similar. We, we've got to <coughs> take into consideration the performance of this new boat, um, the depth of water that it requires and the speed that it travels at. Uh, but I think we're, we're looking at a course area that's going to be um, off Takapuna, uh, Cheltenham, Rangi Light, around that area there, but possibly a range of courses depending on wind direction. Okay, uh, just uh, the other one, you saw all the locations that were dismissed at the outset, like Gulf Harbour and a number of other ones. If, if there was a real you know, rush of interest and we got over that eight, do you, do you think it's possible that, say, the odd syndicate might, might find favour and say going to a place like Gulf Harbour and having the relative anonymity and s s privacy and all the rest of it? Is that a possibility? Uh, I think potentially, if it was a, 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 you know, a single team perhaps, um, water depth is going to be the big issue in some of those locations. Um, can, I, can I just throw a, 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 a harder question and, and address to Sir Stephen. Um, Stephen, you were, you were part of the protest against the port encroaching on the harbour. Um, <laughs> How do, you, how do you see this as being different from the port encroaching on the harbour? <coughs> I think um, if we looked at the Hornsey extension, that absolutely does encroach on the harbour. And I think that's why we're prepared to be flexible and to look at the, you know, the new cluster model, which is a far less intrusive okay. option. Thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, look, I think I'll go to Councillor Newman and then maybe come back with a, another question. It's effectively, thank you, and it's effectively restating the question that I had to Rod Marler and getting your view around the impact of the dispersed model and the, what I feel is a sort of like a lack of relationship between the syndicates one, two, three, and one area, four facing completely differently, five, six, seven, and then eight somewhere else, um, and, and what what impact that has in terms of fragmenting the relationship between the syndicate bases spread over that area and its impact on the, um, on the experience of the, of the village itself from a yachting perspective? Uh, we're usually not that friendly. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> and, and a lot of the teams would actually favour having privacy. Mm -hmm. um, there's absolutely situations where you could see um, certain teams forming an alliance and wanting to be closer together, um, and we'll certainly look at that ourselves. But really, I don't think it's an issue from an operational point of view or, a, or, a, um, or an issue for any of the teams. They, they wouldn't see that as a negative. OK, then. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Sure. If, um, if we flick to the Winyard Point um, option, right? If we had that space available, would that be doable in terms of the requirements for the syndicates? It's, uh, operationally, it might be. Um, I know those bases three and four are in a, in a, in a really um, exposed position. Any breeze from the, the northwest or the north, it's, it's pretty nasty in there, and there'll be actually times <coughs> where I doubt you could launch or retrieve your boat safely from some of those locations. Uh, bases one and two have got a serious lack of water depth. I think it's only about two and a half metres there, or two metres at low water, and we're looking for about five and a half. And you've, you've got a very, uh, uh, what shall I say, a, a, you know, no village atmosphere whatsoever with that arrangement. Uh, Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor, Phil Cashman. Oh, just a very quick question, gentlemen. Between the, the Hulsey extension and the Wynyard Basin options, the big difference, really, other than the extension, is a third the number of super yachts that, that can come in. I guess my question I'm asking of your experience in past regattas is how crucial that is to the overall success for the people who are I guess the funders and the financial contributors to the event. Um, the super yachts, are, super yachts are critical to the teams. Um, and why we say that, a lot of the super yacht owners are usually um, associated with the teams um, and are part of the funding mechanisms for the teams. Uh, in Bermuda we saw BAR, for example, probably had five of their investors who had their super yachts there that were involved with the team, and you find that's a pretty common thread through all the teams. 
I know it is with us, so it is important. Um, that, that's true. There's a there's a reduction in super yacht berthage um, with the with the basin, basin. model. Yeah. Is that a, a, a deal breaker in your opinion, or? Uh, no, I guess I guess the next trick would be to try and find ways where else we could accommodate them oh, yeah. uh, in the Auckland area. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Ross Clay. Just, just sorry, I just want to be clear that I heard, uh, Sir Stephen, did you say the yachting fraternity was prepared to compromise on the the, dis, the uh, dispersed Wynyard Basin dispersed compromise? I don't know about the yachting fraternity, but Team New Zealand are. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so that, that does, that, that does, that's because that's really positive for me, very positive news. Um, so just interestingly though, just to, can you give some feedback either of you from the yachting fraternity about their preference overall? Because obviously there was a very substantial number of yachting people involved in urban Auckland and say, you know, stop sealing our harbour. So, so it must be a dilemma because everyone would be behind the Team New, Ze Team New Zealand and the America's Cup, but, but now they've got this quandary of dilemma Got any feedback of what the general <laughs> feeling is within the, the sailing community? I think it's fairly fair to say that it would be split, and from the soundings I've taken, probably evenly split. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Chris Darby. Thank you. So Stephen and Kevin, Kevin thank you. Um, just oh, no. when I first heard um, when, the, when you successfully won the Cup, Excellent. I heard that the area was, a bit, per challenge, was looking at around about 2,400 squares, and now I think it's 3,000 squares. Um, is that correct, Rod, the, the current numbers, no, 3,000 squares? The, <coughs> the single base is around 1,750 square metres, and the double's about 2,500. The double's are 2,500. Yep. Yep. Okay. So just, um, so we're at about that 2,400 mark. So, I'm, you know, we're, we're working in an environment where the that that environment is really valuable and we're a city that's trying to compact and densify and um, and you know that. So just in terms of that area, how much is pure for pure operations need and how much is earmarked for treating your sponsors necessary uh, and you know, entertaining them and which you might also monetize? Can you just give us a sense of those base demands, operations and wider needs? I think, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rod, but I think basically in that area it's pretty much split evenly 50-50 between the actual base and the forecourt or the, the, the open concrete area where the boat needs to be moved, uh, manoeuvred to have its mast put in um, and put in the water. So it's about 50-50. Um, as far as the hospitality and the like, um, how that's been done in the past, we've taken a small space within the base whether it be two or three floors, we might take a lower floor, uh, pretty small area. Um, I'm talking you know, 15 or 18 metres by six metres. And we, we try to give our sponsors a sort of an in-team experience, so it's like being in the boat shed, really. So it's nothing too flashy. Okay, in, so in it's, it, is, it is mostly operations. Yeah, it's mostly, mostly operations. Okay. It's, it's, it's uh, boat sheds, sail lofts, offices, that kind of thing. Um, this new particular boat is quite tricky that it needs to be put on the ground with its foils stuck out to the side so it's actually 15 metres wide when it's sitting on the ground that's why it's sort of quite space hungry. Mm. In Bermuda uh, we probably only took about 5% of our space for entertainment area the rest of it was all operations. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much Councillor. Councillor Linda Cooper is the last councillor I've got but if you've got a question oh sorry Mike Lee yep Lin Linda. Um, I guess some of the questions, I mean, a lot of them have been answered, but um, in terms of the legacy, um, I suppose I wanted to ask our staff, but um, if this was to be won, and we hope it is won, um, what would you be your expectation in between cups around the use of that area? For example, if the sheds maybe had another use or possibly dismantled, you know, how... What's well, your thoughts around that? Generally what happened between 2000 and 2003 was that the syndicates retained the sheds. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, well, that, I think that's probably what would happen. That's a possibility. If we if we win, I, I think the uh, the time frame may shorten down slightly. When we win. Maybe yep. it's two years instead of three years, and at that case, you'd find that a lot of the teams just stayed put oh, yeah. and carried on their operations. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Right, uh, Councillor Mike Lee. Uh, I, I thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I, I, I've, we've heard quite a lot about the idea of, of the village atmosphere uh, around the America's Cup, and I have to say I'm a, I'm a little bit um, confused about what that really means. Is it the, um, the vibrancy of, 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 of partying and people celebrating, or is it the, the bases all being together? Um, because I'm certainly no expert in this area, but I, I, I would imagine that some privacy, industrial privacy, would be valued um, during operational time, but certainly getting together after match function and all the rest of it is, is um, desirable. So um, when you say... I, I um, heard, heard you respond to um, Councillor Walker's question about the Winyard option, and um, it was said that there wouldn't be the village atmosphere. What actually do you mean by the village atmosphere? I, I, it's primarily a public area. Okay. Um, for example, uh, let's take the Bermuda option. So every day before racing, there's a, there's a large stage. The, the crews are all paraded on stage every day, introduced to the crowd. Uh, there's, a, okay. there's a dock out show, there's an arrival show, there's press conferences. All that sort of happens in the central area in front of the public. Um, and the public are also in a, you know, the teams aren't as secretive as they used to be. And they know they know they have to open themselves up more to the public. So there's an opportunity for the public to walk around the edge of the bases, watch them launch, get up close with the, with the sailors. Okay. Very yeah. interactive sort of approach. Just to come back to, um, thank you, just to come back to um, what Sir Stephen said, and thank you um, for your comments, Sir Stephen. In terms of the, um, the basin, the, the Winyard Basin approach, North Wharf or, or Halsey, um, in terms of uh, the event centre on Halsey Wharf and, and, and the, um, the area to the north of that, would you be open to trying to minimise any um, reclamation or expansion in that area to what is the absolute optimum? Would, in other words, instead of the massive Halsey Wharf extension, um, the lesser extension, but even that seems quite a lot if you look at it from the area to the north of the event centre, um, is that your minimum, or would you be flexible about trying to reduce the impacts even further? I think, based on the numbers that we've given Rod and the team, and they've worked purely on the operational space that's required, I'll pass the ball to him, but I don't think he's going to be able to, you know, squeeze everything in without a heck of a big jar oh, thank of gasoline. You. Yeah. So it's not coming from you guys, all right, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, could, could I just get clarification of that? You're not proposing any reclamation, are you? It's, it's wharf, not reclamation. It's all wharf. Yeah. Thank yep. you. It's, it's piled wharf. Piled wharf. Okay. And Councillor, you. to your point, we will make every endeavour, because we're obviously um, trying to ensure we can keep the costs and the, and the delivery time frame as short as possible. We'll be looking to engineer this thing as tight as we possibly can as well. So we'll be working closely. <laughs> That's fine. With Kevin and his team. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Ross Clay. Um, this could be answered by Rod or Kevin and, and Sir Stephen. Is the Winyard Point um, option on the, sorry, at the northern side, is it the Harborside Bridge side? Um, that would involve a considerable uh, breakwater, which one assumes would have a significant effect on, on uh, West Haven. What would be the effect on West ha the West Haven extension, which would come at some time in the future? Would that totally compromise that as well? Because you'd have the breakwater, you'd have a pretty narrow channel, I would imagine, going shooting through there. So the, the long-term plans for West Haven, you're right, involves an extension on the western arm, <coughs> and um, 
we are currently working through a scheme which is a, a first stage of that at the moment. Um, with the completion of that, um, we would still have sufficient room, although tighter than it currently is, with, it, with, a, with a breakwater that would provide the level of protection required by the bases. However, we wouldn't be pushing that out any further than the current um, zoning requirement, which I think is about 90 metres at the moment. So we wouldn't be going out any further than that, retaining a navigable channel. However, you're right, it is going to reduce it significantly from what it currently is, and I think it's, um, from those using the marina, it will be a significant yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that is another negative for that option, besides the wind and, and shooting through and um, having to dig quite deep. So thank you, just want to reinforce that. If I could just ask another supplementary to Councillor Clay's <coughs> question. With that breakwater as shown on our screen now, uh, would that still leave you with difficulties of both launching and recovery in terms of uh, tide movement and, and wind? I think it does because what we've got to realise is we've got a huge West Haven marina there with, a, with a, a lot of traffic that go in and out through that narrow gap as well as the ferries coming around there every day to refuelling. So you're always going to have wake and swell options going into that base area. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Greg Sayers is the last question. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, thank you, Stephen, Sir Stephen and Kevin, for coming on with your wealth of knowledge. You know, it's just what, already what you've shared has been most helpful. So thank you very, very much for that. And, you know, we, we need to really be basing our decision on reality. The reality is that... New Zealanders want us to host the cup, and we need to invest into that. Uh, reality number two is what gives us our best chance of success for running this event. So uh, I've really appreciated your answer. Um, my question is around trying to get some elaboration around your uh, feedback that you're prepared to consider, perhaps the, you know, moving into the harbour versus you know, this, uh, the basin option. Mm -hmm. you know? So that, that was, thank you so much for sharing that. And... Um, could you just elaborate for us uh, why you're considering um, you know, perhaps the basin option ahead of uh, the uh, extension to the harbour a bit further? Could you just elaborate why you've come to the decision? And is there anything else you'd like to share with us around that decision or consideration? Yeah, I think from a personal perspective, um, I, sh I share the, you know, the concern of Aucklanders about going further out into the harbour. There. So that, for me, was one of the biggest considerations <coughs> and I think secondly there's a cost reduction in going for the smaller model uh, and, and I think thirdly that it's probably reality that the extension was just going to be a bridge too far and too difficult for everybody so we've been pre prepared to be flexible to try and see that we get <coughs> this thing done okay. thank you very much Thank you for that, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Wayne Walker. Sure. Um, going back to the issue about minimising the um, footprint, you'll be going out for the bookings around March through to June next year. Um, quite obviously, based on what the Council uh, determines, there will be a resource consent process that will be occurring in advance of that, and that could be for maybe more than what you need. So in that instance, I'm assuming you'd be pegging yourself back to what the actual requirement is, conceivably more so than the um, consent, even if that was more. Am I making sense? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't understand the consenting process as well as Rod obviously does, but one would assume that if you went for consent for, say, eight syndicates and only six came, that wouldn't be a difficult thing as opposed to the reverse. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, uh, my last question is uh, not really serious, but, you know, if you can win three times <laughs> and we can spread the cost of the infrastructure over three separate races, that Let's would really help. Thing, yeah. Can you give us a guarantee you're going to do your best to do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, can, can, I, can I thank you both for your presentation, for being available to answer questions, for being yeah. frank with councillors, and I think everybody around the table would want us to wish you every success in hosting and winning the cup here in Auckland. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Right, uh, councillors, we're now... Oh, sorry. Sorry, excuse me, Your Worship. Count Councillor Simpson. Um, I, ha I left the room uh, in that item because potentially there may have been a conflict of interest, and so just to clarify, I left the room. So
Oh, you haven't made the... No, no, we no. haven't got to the debate. Oh, we didn't oh, leave again. Uh, but thank you for that you can go away. Uh, <laughs> if you feel that there is a conflict of interest. Uh, okay. You carry on. Yeah. Okay. Then. So does that mean I can vote, Tam? No, you cannot vote. No, no. If cannot vote. Okay, I'm just here for listening to you. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, Five minute rest. If, if, uh, I think we can now move to uh, comments by councillors. I've got... Councillors uh, Hills and Fletcher, you were wanting to comment <coughs> or question? Um, comment. Comment. Okay, that's good. Well, we'll start with uh, Councillor Richard Hills. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Goff. Um, first of all, this, you know, we put a lot of effort into the challenges and the problems, but this is extremely exciting. This is extremely exciting for our city, for Auckland, and for people of all ages. I think that we often focus too much on the challenges and forget to focus on the opportunities and the fact that this is going to be another amazing thing for our city. I was eight years old when we won in 95, and I still remember <laughs> Peter too. Montgomery's um, famous quote, um, and that got me interested in, uh, not that I've ever sailed myself, I've been on boats, but, um, but the fact is it got a lot of people my age, I remember, interested, the ticker tape parades, and then continually celebrating after that the next um, couple of times we had it in our city. So just want to set the record straight that personally, um, I am super excited, and I think this is going to be great. The other thing is I'm really excited. Thank you, um, Sir Stephen and Kevin, for, for your information, and I'm really excited that, that actually it feels like we're getting to a good place with the, um, with the model that, that I preferred, the clustered model. Um, I was really concerned about the Horsey Wharf extension to begin with. I um, did try to get it removed from the options at the beginning, but I'm glad that it was kept in so we could have a proper good look um, right across the board. I think that the clustered option is, is good, and I don't think it's going to be like the San Francisco option, which is a couple kilometres away, mm. you know, five kilometres away spread around. This is 200 metres. This is walking distance. It's, you can sit in the Wynyard Quarter at those restaurants and look pretty safely across to all the, the bases and feel pretty <coughs> close. Um, obviously, the costs are important. It, this is a slightly cheaper option, but I think in the end, we do need to focus on what's best for the city, um, what's best for the for the event, and hopefully we have several events, um, but also the fact that I just was never comfortable with seeing something extend 230 metres further out into into the harbour, and this is only 70 metres. So the, the other one's three times the length, so that was a concern for me. And I think it was something like 33,000 square metres of extra space on top of the ocean there. So I think when we look at what we're wanting to invest long term into the Wynyard Point, that, that's could be and will be one of the coolest parks in the world when we eventually get those leases gone and we're able to invest in that space. And we've decided to have the park on the on the eastern side facing the city. And I just worried that if we'd extended Halsey way out, we actually ruined the whole point of that that park where we're looking back at the city across the water out into um, celebrating everything. <coughs> and if we had these three-story sh sheds right out in the ocean, I would have been pretty concerned. So I'm really happy that many of the, you know, heart of the cities on board with the, the, the mid option, shall we call it, the, the government seems to be happier with that space. We're getting to a good position. I think that um, it's also great to hear that Team New Zealand aren't opposed to that either because that was my worry. Um, just in general, I think we need to make sure as well, yes, it's fantastic and it's awesome, but the whole way through we need to be thinking about the investment we've already put down in the Wynyard Quarter and that whole space all the way to Queen Street and the fact that we need to make sure we keep that place free for people as much as we can, limit the, the cars and the, the trips. And, um, yeah, I, I think this is an awesome opportunity, and the, the, the reason why I seconded it was the, the focus on that clustered option, um, which will be much better. But I think that a lot of water t needs to go under the, under the extension, I guess, on what it looks like in between those stages and what people can expect their public access to the waterfront is. But... I think it's exciting, and thank you. I feel like this has been really, really well done, and we've been able to have so much information in such a short period of time, and I know it's been really difficult for all the officers. So thank you. Thank you very much, <coughs> Councillor. Uh, <coughs> Councillor Fletcher. Well, well, thank you, um, Your Worship. Um, this is really a red-letter day. It's one of those occasions where it's a real privilege to be a member of the Auckland Council and to have the opportunity of coming together and looking at... Um, the, the future of our city. I, I dropped my three-year-old preschooler 
uh, granddaughter off today, and she said, what are you going to do today, Nana? And I said, well, we're going to make a decision about your future. And she was quite excited about that when I explained it to her. And when you think about, you know, we, we are here, but we have, and we're standing on the shoulders of so many people who have gone before, who are enabling us to make these decisions today. And, and I really want to um, acknowledge Sir Stephen Tyndall for agreeing to come and answer our questions because um, he's, he's been a great New Zealander. Not, not only has he aligned himself you know, to all of the success of the America's Cup, but he's been there uh, for me in lots of not-for-profits. You know, I think of Motutapu. He enabled us to have administrators to help us actually move on. And he is a great example of where you put a bit of seeding money in and you grow something really beautiful. So I, I want to thank him sincerely for that today. It had been my intention to move an amendment because I felt we could have dropped one of the options. Um, but I have agreed with the Mayor that it's probably a good idea to leave the three options there because I think it will send a very strong message to the government in Wellington if we can take a united front in terms of the options and in terms of the negotiations. And what I'm hoping is the government will really entertain um, the idea that this is not just a cost that should be borne by the Auckland ratepayer. This is New Zealand Inc. We are making decisions today for New Zealand Inc. And I'm hoping that in conferring um, the responsibility for the negotiations to the CEO and to the Mayor, they will take that strongly on board because I'm expecting great things from the new government in terms of um, relieving the burden on the Auckland ratepayer. So I just hope that that can be uh, taken. And, and I think the Mayor is in a much more strong negotiating position with the government if we can take, hopefully, unanimously today, uh, the decision on this. I guess um, my first ever political action, I was telling some friends as I walked back uh, last night, or was it the night before, what, um, you know, all of us have a memory of something. And the first political action I was ever required to undertake, uh, because w I worked in the marine industry, and uh, was my father when Sir Robert Muldoon decided to slap on a 40% marine sales tax on the marine industry. And it was my first trip officially to Wellington as a young 20-something-year-old to go into Sir Robert Muldoon's office quaking in my legs and telling him basically what an A he was being. And um, it, it remains me, with me, <laughs> that, that experience. But since then, uh, the predictions that uh, some had made uh, to the then government and have continued to make to governments thereafter, the marine industry is huge for New Zealand. The, the potential is utterly unlimited, and we just have to make sure that we set the right framework. It's not something that council needs to pay for. All we need to do is provide the, the right enablements to, to allow that to proceed. So I'm really, really hopeful um, that in today being an important day, that we can set aside all of the noise that we've heard from lobbyists and pressure groups um, this is a day for our personal judgment on what we think is best for Auckland. And experience has taught me that while there can be a hell of a lot of noise and you can come under a hell of a lot of pressure, um, there is immense gratitude later if you get it right. And I, I hope we can get it right. <coughs> so I'm really asking all of you to think, you know, just beyond uh, today um, and also to think beyond the America's Cup. When we lost the America's Cup in 2003, some of us got together to find other uh, um, events that we could actually enthuse people about the harbour. Uh, and in fact, this next coming up in March will be the 10th anniversary of the Rangitoto Motutapu Duel, which was designed for exactly that, to bring people out into the Haraki Gulf to understand and appreciate. And I felt under pressure a little bit because, uh, you know, I, a lot of people have tried to say, you know, there's an inconsistency. You have been a very strong champion since, you know, the early 90s on no further footprint into the Auckland Harbour. And I, I stand by all of the decisions that I have taken, but I also stand by the need, as Daniel and His Worship 
so beautifully articulated the need for creating a future for our young people, particularly from the South. Um, so I, I stand by my credentials as someone who is an early champion of the Haraki Golf Green Park and, and so forth and, and working on conservation. But, you know, what I know today is it's time to help make history. Uh, if you read the, the Herald, you know, it was a red letter day for us and I think that that, that is the opportunity. There's a whole range of things um, that officers need to be congratulated for in the reports, um, but I'm still a little unclear in terms of apples with apples. And unlike uh, Councillor Hills, I'm not yet that wedded to the basin. I could be persuaded that in terms of legacy, there are other opportunities, and I'd like to see more in terms of the scoping of the costs, and I would like the Mayor to give us the commitment that he is going into this with an open mind in terms of any negotiations, but what I do know is that it will make each and every one of us feel incredibly proud, um, and let me say, as the only person in this room who has actually been the Mayor uh, to host during an America's Cup, the 30th America's Cup, hosting that, hosting APEC, seeing many of the same staff here uh, that were there then, and the opportunities that they've actually worked on consistently, I'd like to acknowledge them but to say that this is such a special <coughs> opportunity. Let's make history today and let's try and do it unanimously. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. I gave you your extension without moving it. Uh, uh, how, uh, how very generous. <laughs> thank uh, you. Look, um, I just want to foreshadow a possibility. Um, there are three options there. The reason for the third option was actually because it was Team New Zealand's uh, preference. Let's get rid of it. Uh, I've now heard from Team New Zealand that they're happy with really with uh, B1 as a, as a as an option. I can't take B2 out because <coughs> we still have another party who I don't know the opinion of uh, in regard to the B1 or B2. But I know would be happy to see B3 removed. So I'm foreshadowing I'm, I'm, yeah. that well, I'm, I'm intending yeah. to remove B3, but I won't do it just yet. I want to hear yeah. opinions from Your Worship, speak, speaking, speaking to that. Let's get rid of it. Um, um, I agreed. Sorry, sorry <laughs> Councillor. Um, yeah, I, I, point, I point, of order. Point, point of order. <laughs> point of order. Um, I seek your clarification because we agreed beforehand that I yep, would drop yep. an amendment on the basis that the three options were going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and Let's I, get rid I, of it. I did, I did make that undertaking to you, Thank Councillor, you. In, in, you. in good faith. But I'm hearing from Team New Zealand, who were the main advocate of the Halsey Wharf extension, that they don't require that. So. Um, I, I've foreshadowed it so that there can be some discussion I can hear from other, other yes, councillors about. Sorry, point of order, because uh, I don't think I was next on the speaking list, but we were foreshadowing a motion where we were going to remove Holsley Steve extension as well. Um, well, uh, just to so speak to it. And, between and us all. The, if well, the mood of the council is to remove that. Um, anyone for Holsley Street? Well, the bottom line, the bottom line sorry, is... Sorry, sorry. Uh, it, it's not your call yet, councillor. I've got oh, councillor Darby well coming well up next. Yeah, councillor yeah. Darby. Oh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I had a question. It was actually about B3, and uh, it was along the same lines as yourself and about its removal, having listened to the submitters. Yep. So, dump it. I'll just wait for the mayor. Uh, it, no, it, it, so it is, a, it is. Uh, can, can we put another one in? So, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. My question was about the B3, and from what I've heard today, I think there's good argument for its removal, and I want to acknowledge Sir Stephen's submission here today in regard to B to B3 extension. So can we, tr can we deal with this right now? I don't think it needs necessarily an amendment. I'll take your lead on how we can um, remove it now by um, so uh, consensus. Your recommendation, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, move it. Yeah, I, 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 take it out. Just, just uh, speak, speaking to that point, if I may, um, I, I have foreshadowed it. I can remove it as the mover. I'm, I'm going to give, uh, in due course, Councillor Fletcher a chance, with your indulgence, to speak to that. Um, so, because she never, she, she was not aware of, of the development of my thinking on it. But I want to hear other councillors well on it. Two, two. So if I can now come to <coughs> Councillor Clo, please. Sorry. Yep. Oh. <laughs> it's the second it's the Sorry? Finished. Oh, oh, anyway. Sorry, sorry, Councillor uh, Darby. Look, I'll just finished. take my speaking turn now, Mr. Mayor, okay, because yeah, I think we're, we're starting to head on the right course, not to get too consumed with yachting terminology. 
Um, Mr. Mayor, my first contact with America's Cup was when I turned on TV One, I think in 83, and John Bertrand and Australia Two went out in a, I think it was a starboard course and came back and beat, beat Liberty. And, and that, was, that clicked me into sailing. That's, that was that event that clicked me into sailing. I subsequently had a little 12 meter and I sailed across the Pacific uh, with a friend to Seattle. And I've, I've been absorbed by sailing ever since, and I'm one of those people that will watch a couple of starboard lights go down the Northland coast through binoculars when the Volvo comes in and get quite excited. Yeah, Sounds rather strange, doesn't it? But that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's about sailing. And, um, but I'm also a passionate, I'm also a passionate environmentalist, and uh, I've been uh, encouraged here today to hear the work that Panuku's done and, and also the submissions, um, presentations from Sir Stephen and Kevin Shoebridge. Um, they are also um, quite aware uh, that there is tremendous value in the water body off Halsey, uh, those recreational values, cultural values, etc. cetera. Um, I, I will be supporting these motions as we go forward, but at this stage, I will not be supporting B3. And I want to make that clear, and hopefully it disappears very soon. But um, I don't see any case, uh, no evidence has been presented to continue to support B3 here today. Um, this process, I was quite concerned at the early stages, but with the walk around that we had on Sunday, it started to reveal that there was some really good, solid analysis that was being undertaken. But um, we've still got a way to go uh, to nail this. But, Mr Mayor, uh, I will be supporting uh, progressing this further investigation on the basis of the motions before us, but definitely not B3. And if it's still there at the end of other speaking turns, I don't think it needs an amendment. I think it just needs our consensus leadership to have it removed and to vote, uh, hopefully unanimously, on the balance. Um, <coughs> and um, I, I, I'll take your uh, steer on how we might arrive at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. I just want to listen to a couple more speakers on that. Um, it may be that we simply put, the, put, put that separately. I don't think that we have consensus here, but let me listen to a few more speakers on it. Councillor Clay. If um, Councillor Hills is not willing to remove it, I'm happy to, to uh, second your amendment, which would remove B3 and change the word three to two. And um, I will say that Councillor Lee was willing to second it originally as well. So I just think we should just stop beating around the bush, stop yeah. wasting Make council progress. resources, stop wasting money, and importantly, send a strong message <coughs> to stop sealing our harbours and urban Auckland that we are listening to this. And then I'm hoping also that then in the spirit of the whole thing, that they will be listening to what Ted New Zealand is, who's said, which is to come and compromise at an early stage and at a public stage, that that then starts to reflect on their thinking about we can do something at the Hellsley, but we're not doing the massive big extension. So I think it's really important to send that signal to those that quite legitimately and quite rightfully have great concerns about any further major extensions into the harbour and um, needless to say we've just done it with the yeah. with the dolphin but let's kill it once and for all with this Housley Wharf extension option. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Watson. Uh, th thanks Mr Mayor. Um, but like one of the earlier speakers said I'll, um, I'll be keeping an open mind. I think there is certainly a degree of consensus evolving here but uh, let's face it, the preparations around this have been a bit manic, notwithstanding the good efforts of Panuku, uh, you know, a little bit like Corporal Jones from Dad's Army of, you know, don't panic and everyone's rushing around deciding what to do. I've absolutely no doubt that Auckland will put on a great America's Cup, just like we put on a great America's Cup the last time, just as we put on a great World Cup rugby, cricket World Cup, Commonwealth Games and so <coughs> forth and so on. We've done it plenty of times in the past and, and we'll do it with this again. And perhaps uh, in the past it was with a relative minimum of fuss when I think of uh, Auckland City Council. I, I, I would just say though, Mr Mayor, when I think a bit about it, and um, I'm sure the Team New Zealand crew are more aware of it than us, is it is a sporting event.
and with sporting events there's always a degree of uncertainty so I think as much as I'm sure they won't be getting ahead of themselves I don't think we should be getting too far ahead of ourselves as well because uh, as we know uh, more than any these things can can come and go so I think it's important when we're considering this that we look at the legacy and and when we need look at the legacy when it's kind of spelled out um, it's it's perhaps not quite as impressive um, as we would like it to be if, if we're going in this uh, particular direction I know uh, Joel Cayford was been quoted a few times this week talking about the, the general history of uh, the waterfront which is you know basically uh, privatisation of public land, not, uh, notwithstanding the, the public realm that have emerged, but that's been the general trend. So it'd be nice if we could bucket this time, uh, buck that trend this time. My concern, and I, I, and it hasn't been alleviated, is, is still the 73 metres that, that we're going into the into the Horsey <coughs> Basin there, and and if you look at our waterfront, that is quite a specific vista. So the outlook from Princess Wharf to Queen's Wharf and then to, uh, to, to Halsey uh, are all very distinctive. And that, that's the part of Auckland where you have the biggest water view there out to uh, Bayswater and the North Shore. So um, I'm encouraged by the attitude of Team New Zealand that we, we bear that in mind and, and although uh, the 73 metre figure has been mentioned, that's still a concern and that's, that's not going to go away um, in a hurry, I don't think. Um, as far as um, the, 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 the costs go, um, well, I guess this, this has a bit going to, for it in, in terms of the cost as well, but I, I think uh, you know, there is a danger of penny-wise, pound-foolish in this if that legacy in terms of defending it continues. Um, but as I said, it is a sport, and sports are unpredictable. So I guess, Mr. Mayor, and I, no, I, 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 without any further ado, I, I just like to signal Indeed. I'm going to support this, but I am keeping an open mind because the, a lot of stuff has come to us very quickly, and I'm sure there's there's other things that maybe can be done or improved that we might hear hopefully before that December point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Philippina. Thank you, Your Worship. <laughs> um, yes, Your Worship, the, trot. The, 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 the comments I have, are, I'm going to split up into two sections. The first section is in regards to the Māori impact statement, and I've seen now over the last few weeks in reports, and I am not going to blame Pānuku in regards to this, but I think we need to do better around our, our consultation with mana whenua. Uh, I really do, because uh, we've ended up having uh, a lot of our CCOs having their own mana whenua group, but I think uh, at some stage we need to have a group that, that, that the Ngā mana whenua are part of. So I, I made my comments in the uh, item 13, and I've made my comments in regard to this, and I've got the surety that this will improve, because there are some comments under the Māori impact report uh, that I was concerned about. And, and, and I will bring those to your attention, Rod, uh, after this instead of uh, through, through this forum. So, look, uh, that, that's one part. Uh, my, my last part is around uh, the option. And um, uh, Councillor Hill said that he was eight uh, when the America's Cup, the first one. I was ten. <laughs> <laughs> look, you know, I, my, my, my concerns, and this is why the questions I asked Could the questions a breach of I did... <laughs> was, um, <laughs> Your Worship, uh, the, the question I asked around the super yachts is, is solely and wholly because of the, the economic benefit that, that we will get and seeing eight to ten berths um, that will be available for the super yachts it, at least gives me comfort in regard to that. The, the last, uh, con well, there was another concern, but that got alleviated by Sir Stephen and, and also with Kevin. And, and that, that, that issue was around the berths because... All our, our workings, the, the long list, the short list, was all around the eights. Um, hence the question around your worship, 15, uh, the, the, the San Francisco um, sort of issue. Um, and hearing um, Kevin say that, no, look, it's going to be first in, first serve, it's going to be eight, because I didn't want uh, another report coming back and saying, guess what, we've, we've got ten now. You know, I mean, look, that's just going to raise so many issues that, that we don't want to get ourselves into. So I support 
um, the recommendations, and, and I mean, I don't know how, I, I think, uh, Your Worship, you've said that Horsley Wharf is just going to be put, then we're going to vote yes or no on it. Uh, I agree with the deletion of three, um, because this is why I walked over and saw uh, Sir Stephen and, and, and Kevin just to confirm that, uh, that Horsley Street extension, um, they are okay with that being removed. So, Your Worship, uh, one more comment I will make. It's in regards to uh, you removing, um, I think it was E, B3. out of this, was, I think it was E you removed? Oh, the original The uh, original H. E on our papers? H. H, H was it? Yep. yep. So, look, I, I'm glad you, you did, because I was going to sort of um, ask you to, to see if you could move it. Uh, street there, so I'm, I'm just glad that that has happened. So, Your Worship, look forward to the America's Cup in 2021, and yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Councillor. All I can say is if you were 10 then, you're 33 now, and you yes, haven't aged thank well. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. Oh, oh. Councillor Newman, you, you look like you're 40, not 33, <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Newman. Well, <coughs> Mr. Chair, um, Thank you. Um, there will be a, well, I think there will be a consensus emerging, um, actually, if, if B Roman numeral three remains. Um, I love the America's Cup. Um, I first became aware of the America's Cup uh, when we, well, we chaired for KZ7 Plastic Fantastic off the coast of West Australia at Fremantle, <laughs> and we went a long way towards winning that America's Cup, that first ever campaign. Um, and I remember the excitement and then it became the frustration uh, in 1992 when we came unstuck over the bowsprit and I remember black magic in 1995 and we all wore our lucky red socks. Um, I remember that amazing ticker tape parade up Queen Street. Um, it still is, is very uh, fresh in my mind that, that, that experience, what a wonderful day it was to be a New Zealander. And I remember the tragedy of, of losing it in 2003, but we still conducted that defence with great honour. Uh, actually, as I recall, <coughs> I, I think that New Zealand was the first nation outside of the United States that actually successfully defended the America's Cup. Um, and when you go down to the Viaduct Harbour today, you have to ask yourself, well, what was the catalyst for that? And I would argue that significantly the transformation of the Viaduct Harbour uh, was due in no small part the America's Cup. Um, so, look, um, Your Worship, I know that um, some d tough discussions have taken place in recent times, but hand on heart, Your Worship, I actually support the Horsey Wharf extension. Um, and um, I think that it provides the best public access. I, pr I think it is probably the most efficient. I think that it provides um, for a waterfront area that can be activated. I think it provides an opportunity uh, for a permanent Volvo Ocean Race boat yard. And I think that there is opportunity there for future commercial development. And I know that there'll be a lot of people who will accuse me of being a heretic for saying that. Um, I read this morning in the Herald, Your Worship, Dr. Kayford, um, writing about Team New Zealand's option being, quote, biased to private development. Well, Your Worship, um, a couple of things. I take an active interest in what the Herald publishes, and I enjoy what Dr. Hay uh, Dr. Kayford's <coughs> analysis, even though I disagree with some of his arguments. But with respect to the, to the core message about private development, well, yes, that's correct. That's why we have a mercantile heart, Your Worship, a marine industry. That's why we have jobs in the marine industry. I saw, uh, and I think it's a remarkable <coughs> uh, fact, that 160 super yachts to visit, with the average spend being $2.7 million each. That is really, really powerful. I don't know where you can leverage um, better than that. Um, and it goes back to the point uh, that I made in an earlier debate, Your Worship, about those jobs. And some people in our community have made it. And good on them. 
and some of them are generous to others and others who have made it pull the ladder up after themselves. Well, I represent a community where those jobs are needed. So I, I'm looking for what could be uh, the best um, uh, regatta and then the best legacy and the opportunity for development from that. Um, notwithstanding that, Your Worship, um, I understand um, the wind shifts around this table. I might not always agree with it, uh, but I am sensing that there is support for um, uh, this dispersed option. Well, if there is support for that, and that is something that the Team New Zealand can support, Emirates Team New Zealand can support, I'm not going to stand in the way of that. I, I came here today saying, thinking to myself, I do not want to be the councillor who voted for an outcome that meant that the America's Cup ended up being defended in Italy. Um, if it can be defended here in Auckland with a dispersed option, fine. Um, it's not my first preference, Your Worship, but I want to see that America's Cup in this country defended. I want that investment to take place because I want those jobs and I want the <coughs> aspiration uh, for the community that I represent uh, that not only can we produce um, yeah. young men and women uh, who can uh, compete as the sailors of the future, but also that they can contribute as employees and owners, part owners in the marine industry, uh, because that is a worthy aspiration uh, for those young people in South Auckland. So, Your Worship, if you are, if you are wanting agreement from, from me, um, I am willing to go along with your preferred option, but I have to say that I share the sympathy, uh, I share the view of Councillor Fletcher uh, who wants the Halsey Wharf extension in B3 to remain, and I support that um, remaining because that certainly is the view that personally um, I adhere to, uh, but I'm willing to accept that that might not be the final outcome. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Linda Cooper. Thank you, Mr Chairman. And I hope, um, because I am going to repeat some of the things that have been said, because you have asked for our views, and I don't want you to assume that there's consensus, so I'm hoping there's no point of order in that regard. Um, so for me, I mean, all of the things that Councillor Newman and uh, Councillor Fletcher have said, um, for me, um, and, and I certainly don't think I heard from Team New Zealand an enthusiastic adoption. I, I heard rather an acquiescence um, to do with um, compromise, I guess, but I didn't hear some of the things that were claimed. Um, for me, the Halsey extension is part of the 2012 waterfront plan. It was something we were going to do anyway. And as Councillor Newman said, and Councillor Fletcher actually worked on and had the bravery to do, um, that kind of um, work is a trigger to develop the next level. Mm -hmm. And every time we've had good development, it's gone on the back of um, America's Cup. And I remember, I'll do a history lesson. I remember Sir Bob Harvey taking me um, down to the launch of the last campaign um, and talking about what was possible here. And, and certainly, um, you know, we've had a lot of development back here through Waterfront Auckland and private development. And I don't think any of us could say that was bad. It actually made a huge difference. We look at North Wharf now, I mean, it's just incomparable to what we had before, and it was the next step after um, the viaduct. Um, for me, you know, the, Hall the Halsey extension is really, you know, it's better public access. You know, it's not beyond the current adjacent wharfs. It's better legacy. It provides a really fantastic sheltered public aquatic event area and I think that's important because it's not just about what Team New Zealand wants. If we're going to spend this money, it's got to be the best possible legacy, mm. not something about half-baked. And, and I would have to say that our region has a history when it was a divided and many councils of a lot of half-baked things and political <coughs> timidity because we were either scared, we, we said we didn't have enough money. You know, and it wasn't until, you know, but we have had some bravery and it's delivered things like Britomar, you know, that got stalled because then, you know, people who were brave got, were got rid of. Um, and I think that is one of the risks here. So, 
I don't want a, us to regret um, taking away an option. And I think, look, you can say there's a preferred option, but I really couldn't support the Halsey Wharf extension being take, taken out because if this is, if we're approving um, these options to look at what are the options, how are they developed, I think whoever you're talking to needs to look at those three options. To be quite honest, I mean, the, um, the Winyard East and West, the, you know, isn't the greatest option. In actual fact, it ends up being nearly as much as um, the extension with, if you add on all the lost opportunity and the $18 million for contractual um, relocations. So for me, this is about what's possible in the future, not having to do the half option here and then in five or 10 years going, oh, well, actually, we need to make it bigger. And then you probably spend just as much as gain because we know that cost escalations always leave us there. Um, going down there to have a look at it, you know, that area in front of the current housing wharf is not well used at all. You can't swim off it. You can't do any of that stuff. You know, in an open air, open sort of space like that, it is not used. So for me, um, I really would ask you, or ask people around the table, not to take out that option. It's a discussion. It's for discussion. And so for me, um, it's not the full picture of what's available if you take that out. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know where that leaves us if we don't support um, an option that doesn't have a Halsey Wharf extension. I don't think it truly reflect, reflects the views around the table if we just take it out and don't allow that discussion. Mm. At the end of the day, we may come with a compromise, but let's not cut off an opportunity. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Mike Lee. Um, um, Mr. Me, I don't want to hold up the meeting. It, it, we've had a long day, and um, I think we've made quite a lot of progress, but um, time will tell. Um, m my point is I would uh, support an amendment um, or yourself changing your recommendation to simply remove the Halsey Wharf extension. Um, that seems to be after all the deliberations and briefings we've had and questions, that seems to be um, the majority opinion of all the parties that it would be sensible to refine down the options and make more progress. Otherwise, um, if you include all those three options, um, we may as, not, may as well not have had uh, today at all. So let's make some progress and let's please reassure the public by um, getting rid of the Halsey Wharf extension very much. Councillor, <coughs> Councillor Wayne Walker. I'd like to agree with Councillor Mike Lee. I'd suggest that the person whose shoulders we stand on the most at this point is Sir Peter Blake. Sir Peter Blake went through a transformation. He became arguably the globe's most prominent environmentalist. And if he was here today, he would say, let's make this the most sustainable event we can. Let's minimise any compromise to the Haraki Gulf, the Wainamata Harbour. That's what he would say today. Yes, he would. And he would say, take out Halsey Wharf extension, we don't need it. I don't think we can... <laughs> so that's, that's where I'm coming from. The legacy around this event is around sustainability. It's obviously around winning the America's Cup. We want to do that. We want the boat to go faster. But equally, we want to retain that magnificent harbour. That's what's important. And we need to apply that through the design of these sheds that are going to be large structures, <coughs> through how we operate the vent, through everything we do. It must be sustainable and it must carry Sir Peter's legacy forward. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Councillor Sayers. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just to give you some feedback, uh, Mr Mayor, and to be helpful, in, in terms of your Chair's recommendations, uh, I think subparagraph C is very clear. Um, so uh, that's my feedback to you. I just think your, your, your uh, wording in C is very clear about the third option. I think you'd have full support around it. Thank you, thank you very much, Councillor. Last speaker that it's uh, signalled is Councillor Clay. 
I'm just following up um, just to see what's happening oh, with okay. the removal of seed because I so did fall for shadow. Um, yep. no, let, 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 me, let me explain that yep. then. Um, and I'll, I'll speak on it at the same time, if I may, councillors. Uh, first of all... Process question. I'm, yeah, okay, and, yeah. And, and there's a, if, if you don't like the way that I'm proposing, you'll, you'll have a chance to, to, to address that. Um, firstly, I started off the day by asking councillors to respect the views of others even when they didn't agree with them. And I want to thank all councillors actually for doing that in this debate. Uh, I think it's been uh, a really constructive and positive debate. Uh, people have expressed different points of view. Uh, if I was bold, I might suggest that there is a consensus around the table about wanting to host the America's Cup here, as there should be, um, but there is not a consensus about uh, whether those are the three options to carry forward. So let me say that how I want to, uh, to, to do that is to put... Uh, B separately, so you would be approving the inclusion of each item one, two, and three uh, seriatim, uh, and if you don't want it included, you would vote against it. Uh, so that will give everybody the chance to express their views. Let me go one step further. There is a reason why I formulated the original recommendation in the way that I did. Uh, there are three direct parties to the negotiations, Team New Zealand, and if we didn't meet Team New Zealand's basic requirements, needs, then the Cup wouldn't be held here. So I began this meeting with uh, the understanding that Team New Zealand would want to have, as part of that negotiation, the Halsey Wharf extension. Uh, I want to thank Team New Zealand, uh, Kevin and Sir Stephen, for the flexibility that Team New Zealand has shown. Uh, I know that that was their preferred option. They've listened to the public, they've listened to a wide range of groups, and they want to try to get as many New Zealanders as they can behind the race, and they've said, okay, we're prepared to drop that option and go for the option focused on the Wynyard Basin. The other two options are there, <coughs> B2, uh, that was an option that seemed to me to make most sense and that when I talked around to you individually, uh, I sensed the greatest amount of support for. That's why I've put it up as a preferred option. Team one, I believe, needs to be there because the other party to the negotiation is the government and if we don't have that option there and we make this decision unilaterally, we go in without having a negotiation because you can't go into a negotiation with your hands tied to say, this is the only thing we'll accept. There's got to be that room to, to manoeuvre. The Minister was interested in exploring that option, and for us to proceed in good faith, I need to have uh, option, um, oh, sorry, B2 in. B1 is my preferred option. Let me get that quite clear. So what I'm suggesting to you, councillors, is that we have a vote on each of those, and you will vote, if you vote against approving it, and there's a majority against, that option drops out. We may be left with one option, we may be left with three, that's entirely up to the governing body. Uh, can I talk briefly to the substance of what we're doing today? Uh, I think the clearest memory that I have of the morning that we won the last race for the America's Cup was sitting at the front of the Royal New Zealand Yacht Squadron uh, down at West Haven, just watching, we had it on a big screen, just watching the faces of a whole lot of kids that were between, I reckon about five and 15, looking up at that screen with absolute inspiration from what they were seeing. And the whole mood of that place and the mood of the parade that we held. It's extraordinary for us to hold a parade. It was raining, 90,000 Aucklanders turned up to celebrate our winning of the America's Cup. This is not just a minor sporting event. It's not just the business of Team New Zealand racing as part of one of many syndicates. There was an enormous amount of New Zealand and Auckland pride tied up in that. And I believe, and whether you were eight or 10 at the time that we won it last time, that we all remember the vibrancy and the excitement that that race brought to Auckland. It really, you know, it, it's a rare occasion when you see so many people out there celebrating, united in a belief in something 
showcasing New Zealand sportsmanship, showcasing being at the top of our game in, in world-leading technology and yachting, celebrating uh, how, how good our team was and how proud we felt about them. So I, I think that's really valuable. There is a, you, you've got to look at the economics of it. Uh, the economic benefits, according to the report we have in front of us, is that over the three years it will bring us in something between 500 million and a billion dollars. And it's a little bit like our discussion this morning. Would you really say, no, I'm sorry, we don't want that benefit to the economy? Uh, I think we'd be nuts. Uh, you know, it will produce between four and 8,000 jobs, according to the information that we have in front of us. And, you know, there's the other side of the ledger from, from the, the economic benefits. It's called the economic costs. We have not budgeted to expend this money on posting the America's Cup. What are we up for? We don't know. Um, I hope that the government would have come to the party with at least half of the funds. Oh, more than and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Three I, I, I am ambitious for more, Councillor Lee. Um, but uh, uh, on the basis, yeah, but I'm also a realist, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> on the basis that most of the extra revenue that comes in doesn't go to us, sadly. We get a bit, Rod, you're right, from the super yachts. But most of the money is an extra GST, income tax, company tax. And we would really hope that the government would come to the party. But, you know, I've talked with both the former and the present government on this. And I don't want to create false expectations on your part about their, their uh, generosity uh, and, and what they want to contribute. So we will have to pay a share. We haven't budgeted for it. That is something that when we cast our votes for this, that we have to take into account. But, you know, I, I think that if we took a short-sighted view and said, we're so broke, we've, we've got so many demands on us for infrastructure that we can't put anything into this, I don't think we'd have the support of our constituents that voted us into this place. I think they'd want a much wider view. And I want to, um, Councillor Simpson's not here, but I want to pick up her point about the legacy. Um, you know, there is a legacy here. It's a sheltered space that is created in that basin. Um, uh, between Wynyard Wharf and Halsey Street Wharf. Uh, there is the opportunity for marine sports and things like waka armour, uh, dragon boats and so on. Uh, I think that perhaps the, the best legacy will be that we go into this cup with the intention of winning it and that we amortise the cost of the infrastructure, not over one race, but hopefully over two, three, four, or whatever your ambitions might be. And I know Team New Zealand is ambitious about that. So the cost is real, the benefits are real. Uh, I think the debate has been a good one. Uh, we now have to go in to the discussion to, to finalise the detail with Team New Zealand, with the government. We'll be talking further. Uh, Councillor Filipina, your point about Mana Whenua, there will be discussions with Mana Whenua about it and, and again with some of the major stakeholders. But the feedback I've had from those groups is that the uh, V1 option is their preferred option. I think that's where the majority opinion will fall. So I would commend that as a preferred option, but I'm leaving it up to councillors to determine which of the other two options they would like to leave in as approving that option as a basis for continued discussion. Absolutely. So uh, I hope that's reasonably clear, but uh, Councillor Clo, uh, if you'd like to comment. Well, it's not comment, it's just to clarify, because the way it's going to be handled does give the option for those of us who really don't want to muck around to in the end just vote for one option and vote two down. Well, okay. Can, can because the way, the way you're phrasing it is that's... So is that really what sure. we want to do, or is handling it by an amendment a cleaner way of doing it by dropping, by the amendment that we foreshadowed, that we would just merely be dropping B3? No, I, I'm, I'm happy for councillors to vote on each option. I explained why I had three options there originally. The reason for one of those options is gone. Team New Zealand has said that they that they are prepared to, to support option B2. The reason I need B1 left in is because that is no, no, no. what Otherwise. the government wants to have explored. Other way around. And, and, I, and, I, and I, B2, B, B1 is the option that, that I prefer. 
B2 is the option that the government uh, would like to leave in there at this stage. B3 was the option that was there because Team New Zealand said that was their preferred option. They have now changed their position. Councillor Lee. Mr. Ming, I, I, it's, getting, it's a long day and, and it's, uh, it's okay. not an easy job chairing a meeting like this all day, but to avoid getting into a muddle, um, could we keep things simple? Uh, I think there is a majority opinion that Halsey Wharf mm. extension should go. There are good reasons, given the interests of the government um, and your own preferences, which most of us, I think, support, of keeping one in, but also two. So at this stage, let's make some progress by cutting the three options down to two, and soon enough, after your discussions with the government, um, we'll get them down to one. But um, otherwise, it could get into an awful muddle. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Hills and then Councillor Quacks. Oh, no, uh, well, it's probably all over now, but I, as the second, I kind of, you know, as someone who is completely against the Halsey extension, I kind of would have left all three in and negotiate hard on our option because I felt like we were all getting to a positive space. And I sometimes the That's politics right. okay. can, can, but now we're going to vote on three different and you're probably going to end up with one to go. So, I mean, even though viciously opposed to the Halsey Wolf extension, I would have left them all in and just, yeah. we could have done so Kumbaya and, and walked yeah, together. There, there, are, different, there yeah. are different views on that, Councillor yeah. Hill, and that's why we're in the situation we and are. You Councillor will end up with one. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with all due respect to um, um, Councillor Lee, and he's, he's, uh, I think that the best way to deal with this is just simply to leave the three options in there. And that will, that will actually be the way we test the mood uh, and the preferences <coughs> of, the, uh, uh, of the council rather than just taking it out because we seem to think that there may be uh, a preference to leave out three. Um, quite, quite frankly, uh, we just go there and vote, vote. You can either vote for the whole lot, vote for two, vote for one, and well, let's let's just do it that way. And I think that was the way that um, you preferred to do it. Yep. I, I, look, there are different views on it. Some want three to remain. Some want it to go. It could be done by an, a formal amendment. I'm simply saying we'll go through it, seriatim, vote exactly. one after the other, and let's if you want it. to. Take it out, you'll vote against approving it. That's pretty straightforward. I'm pretty sure everybody understands that. So let's... let's. Well, sorry, uh, point of order. Um, uh, you've got two councillors here not necessarily happy with that approach. I mean, look, I'll just reiterate again. We're going to end up coming out with the Hobson's choice here. We haven't made a decision at all in, in the end. If we end up there with three, then we're going to send it off for renegotiation again. I mean, we haven't made a decision. I mean, we're spending... Uh, people are looking for direction. Stop stealing our harbour in urban Auckland are looking for direction. Team New Zealand are looking for direction. I, I, what we're proposing is to remove it in order to... And I'll make the point again, if we can get stop stealing our harbour in urban Auckland to get behind... The pre preferred option, which is, is, is B1, then that's a win-win, and we've shown some leadership. We've dropped out the one that Council seems to be objectionable Council to everyone. Councillor, you can do exactly what you want to do by voting against exactly. uh, B3, which I'm going to give you the opportunity to mm. do right now. Exactly. So exactly. let's take uh, the, the uh, re recommendation one point at a time. So I move, well, it's been moved and seconded, uh, A. All those in favour of A, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Do I take that's unanimous? Yep. Yes. yes. Passed unanimously. Thank you very much. I want to now put B1, so whether you approve that as an option going forward. All those in favour of B1 as an option going forward, please say aye. 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 Those against? Do I take that as unanimous? Thank you very much. That's great. That sends a very clear message. Vision on three. Uh, yeah. Cluster uh, uh, B2 as an option going forward. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? No. And I want that recorded, please. Okay. That's uh, carried by 18 or 19 to 1. Uh, I declare that carried. And option three, approving that as an option going forward. Division. All those in favour, by, please say... By division. By division. By, by by division. I, we'll do that by division. Okay. Um, uh, so we'll ask officers to, to call the division on whether you want the Halsey Wharf extension option to go forward.
Mayor Goff. Uh, opposed. Deputy Mayor Cashmore. No. Councillor Clough. No. Councillor Collins. Against. Councillor Cooper. For. Councillor Darby. Against. Councillor Filipina. For. Councillor Fletcher. For. Councillor Hills. No way, Jose. <laughs> <laughs> uh, formally, I think that means no. <laughs> Councillor Hulse. Aye. Councillor Lee. No. Councillor Newman. For. Councillor Quacks. For. Councillor Sayers. For. Councillor. Uh, Kit Stewart. Sorry. No, Councillor no. Sayers. Councillor Sayers is for. Councillor Stewart. I've got laryngitis. No, sorry, I've got laryngitis. <laughs> that was a no. No. <laughs> Councillor Sir John <laughs> Walker. No. Councillor Wayne Walker. No. Councillor Watson. No. So, that I declare that um, the, the approval not to be given for that to go forward. Okay, thank you very much for that. that I, I think that was useful, councillors, because it indicates the spread of opinion around the room, which we wouldn't have had uh, but for the vote on it. Um, we now up to uh, recommendation C. Uh, oh, well, we've, we've, I think we've, we've, we've basically done that, haven't we? Um, oh, no, no, we, we should no, put no, it. No, it should be all, all those haven't. in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Can I record against, please? Uh, you may. Thank you. Um, against which one? Everything against C. C going forward at this stage. Yeah. Against um, the basin. Sorry, can, can we bring that down again on the screen again, please? No, the other way. Against D. Against C. Uh, all those in favour of D, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Recommendation E. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Recommendation. Sorry, if I just point of order, just to clear, be quite clear on these um, these resolutions, by just saying location in the middle of there, that means there would definitely be no further investigation of any other location other than the two specified. Oh, or do we right. have to put no, location? Okay, right thank you. No, no, it's, it's fine. Yep. Um, recommendation <laughs> F. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Recommendation G. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Yes. Recommendation H. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. Carried. Thank you very much, uh, and ladies and gentlemen. It's Mayor, we may we may need to in B just make a, a consequential change from three to two. Uh, two. No yes. Thank you. That's that. That's. That's quite right. Right, we now come, if I can find my run sheet. Let's, let's have a five-minute break, I think, and then we'll move on to the next item. <laughs>